latest unavailable. All because one company dared to wonder if the road to better healthcare could literally be the road that runs through town. That's the inclusive future. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Where will you be in five years? Where will we be in five years? In 25? In 50? Let's be here and here with her and him and they. Let's connect them. Let's connect everyone. Let's deliver technology that gives them access to power opportunity. Let's set a new standard for data security and personal privacy. Let's change the system. Promote equality and fairness in the workplace. Let's tear down the barriers to social justice for a more inclusive world. Let's clean house, zero carbon, zero waste. Because the health of our family is tied to the future of our home. Let's gather resources and partners, steer toward our greatest challenges and accelerate. For the benefit, for all. Cisco has made it its purpose to power an inclusive future for all. Where will we be in 50 years? Let's go see. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Yellow is the color of the sun. It's light, it's warmth. Yellow is a light bulb, illumination, inspiration. Yellow is my promise to even the odds for kids through education. Yellow Hab is about the students embracing and engaging the yellow lens of possibility. We are reimagining education, and to do that, we need like-minded partners. Cisco is driven by innovation and imagination, but our purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. Cisco shares Yellow Hab's vision of inclusivity, and we are so happy to announce our partnership to provide state-of-the-art networking, collaboration, and security tools for Yellow Hab and its students. Partnering with companies like Cisco that really believe in what we're doing is what we're all about. And we're just getting started, so let's make it happen. Humans and nature. We're in this together. Yet nature has given and given. It's our turn to do more. Cisco Smart Building Solutions and our partner's technology benefit both humans and nature. Catalyst switches connect securely, delivering power over Ethernet, reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. Cisco Wireless and DNA Spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet. And collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hybrid work is here. It's there. It's everywhere. But for someone to be able to work from here or here, there has to be someone here making sure everything is safe, secure, consistent. So go ahead, log in from here, dial in from here, sit in from here, assured that someone is here with a view of everywhere, ready to fix anything, anytime, anywhere even here. That's because nobody, and I mean nobody, makes hybrid work work better. Cisco, the bridge to possible. At Cisco, we believe inclusion isn't just the right thing to do. It's the innovative thing to do. Because every invention, every improvement, every achievement, every small step and giant leap inside our company and in the history of the world started when a different perspective was invited. 
A different voice was elevated. A different opinion was accepted. To us, inclusion is progress. And it's why we're reimagining how people come together. Changing the system. Tearing down barriers. Respecting and honoring each other's identities. Promoting equality and fairness. Using technology to create more opportunities. And powering a more inclusive future for each other. For good. For all. A cyber attack can grind everything to a halt. Cisco Security keeps your network and your company moving forward. Because if it's connected, it's protected. Cisco. If we're to build a bridge to an inclusive future, then getting healthcare to everyone, everywhere is critical. Take rural Europe, where local doctors leaving for big cities is creating a medical desert. For patients left behind, many lack the mobility or the flexibility to reach critical urban appointments. The remedy, it turns out, is as much a technological marvel as it is a medical one. Meet Medibus, a state-of-the-art clinic on four wheels. But designing such a wonder came with its own set of challenges, taking everything Cisco knows about mobility, connectivity, video conferencing, and security into account. And together with partner Deutsche Bahn, dispatching it from the cloud to create a 21st century lifeline. Now, no area is too remote, no diagnosis or specialist unavailable. All because one company dared to wonder if the road to better healthcare could literally be the road that runs through town. That's the inclusive future. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Where will you be in five years? Where will we be in five years? In 25? In 50? Let's be here and here with her and him and they. Let's connect them. Let's connect everyone. Let's deliver technology that gives them access to power opportunity. Let's set a new standard for data security and personal privacy. Let's change the system. Promote equality and fairness in the workplace. Let's tear down the barriers to social justice for a more inclusive world. Let's clean house, zero carbon, zero waste because the health of our family is tied to the future of our home. Let's gather resources and partners, steer toward our greatest challenges and accelerate. For the benefit, for all. Cisco has made it its purpose to power an inclusive future for all. Where will we be in 50 years? Let's go see. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Yellow is the color of the sun. It's light, it's warmth. Yellow is a light bulb, illumination, inspiration. Yellow is my promise to even the odds for kids through education. Yellow Hab is about the students embracing and engaging the yellow lens of possibility. 
We are reimagining education, and to do that, we need like-minded partners. Cisco is driven by innovation and imagination, but our purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. Cisco shares Yellow Hab's vision of inclusivity.
Welcome to the Women of Impact 2023, and happy International Women's Day to all of our members. This year marks an important milestone in the women of Cisco community, as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of Women of Impact, our flagship event. Congratulations to everyone who has worked so hard for the last 10 years to bring this impactful event to so many. This is my second year participating, and I'm honored to be included in the special milestone event this year. Every year, the women of Cisco America's board and volunteers make it an amazing experience for all participants by highlighting and providing a platform to discuss critical topics. So thank you for donating your time and effort towards the collective purpose of embracing equality. I believe that to drive real change, we need to be intentional in what we do and how we show up at the individual, team, organizational, and societal levels. This organization demonstrates this throughout the year. I agree, Tamaya. To make real change, we must be powered by purpose, which is this year's theme. During today's virtual programming, each of you will have an opportunity to participate in conversations where you can explore topics that will help you in your own future, your career, and your wellness. I've long said that one of the most rewarding and impactful things that we can do as leaders is to lift all boats. It's us who can make an impact and turn the tides. I am honored to have that opportunity to partner with Tamaya and to do just that for all of you. I encourage you to dive in. I encourage you to take advantage of all that Women of Impact has to offer. You'll hear about topics like how to prioritize your passions, owning your holistic wellness, and the role that intentional allyship plays in our career journey, and how to leverage inclusive communities in owning your future. We thank our members, allies, customers, and partners for joining us today. And we hope to see you in tomorrow's chapters activities. Hello, and welcome to Women of Cisco Impact 2023. I'm Huma Hamid. I'm the co-lead for Women of Impact Americas with my awesome partner in Impact, Kerry Martin. And I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of the whole Women of Impact team who worked tirelessly to put this amazing show together. This year, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of this amazing event. What an amazing journey of sisterhood, allyship, and creating impact together. This year's theme is powered by purpose, which is recognizing the strength of our purpose and how each one of us can play a part in advancing our journey forward. We're also celebrating International Women's Day and pledging to be intentional about embracing equality at work and in life. And without any further delay, I would like to introduce you to our keynote speaker. We have put an amazing show together and we are here to welcome Patty Grimm, who is our keynote speaker. Patty is a radio show host. She's a leadership expert, a business coach, a speaker, and also the author of the book, Quiet Women Never Change History. She's passionate about empowering women to be the best they can be. And she's here today to talk us to talk to us about living with intention. Welcome, Patty. Thank you, Huma, and, and thank you everybody for joining us today in this amazing 10th anniversary, International Women's Day. It's a fantastic event, so special thanks to Huma for putting this together with Carrie, and also for my good friend, Michelle, uh, who I'm sure many of you know, Michelle Raguzzi McBain, the, who was a good friend of mine for many, many years. In fact, I've got a picture of her holding up my book in a little bit. So I'm coming to you today from my hotel room in beautiful downtown San Diego. I happen to be here because I did a, an event yesterday. But what's in interesting is I had a month, one beautiful morning. I got up like I do every day. I usually get up around 5.30 or 6. I go outside and just breathe. 
before I touch a phone, a computer, I'm living with intention because I want to start my day off with intention by going out stay outside and experience cold, beautiful, fresh air. Now, normally I live outside of Dallas, Texas, uh, in a little community called Aubrey, where my neighbors are longhorn steers, cows, horses, goats, chickens, and a few people. Uh, so I'm normally I'm out there. And even when it's cold, when we had a snowstorm, I'm still outside for that first five minutes to just breathe in the air and start my day with intense and 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 per and purpose, right? I even today took a little bit of a walk, found a little coffee place down the street, a little great place for a little Mexican breakfast burrito, all these wonderful things. And I did my wall Pilates, which if you haven't tried wall Pilates, you should try it. You can find some free videos on YouTube, but give it a try. It's super, super fun. So I like to start my day with intention and energy. And this is really an exciting time for all of us as International Women's Day to really look back that in 2010, 2020, we celebrated the 100 year of women's right to have vote and the women's right to equality back over, you know, over 20, over 20 years, over 100 years ago. So it's really exciting for us to do that. So I'm going to talk to you today about living with intention, purpose and passion, and to rediscover your best self. What the video just talked about when it highlighted things like embrace equity, be intentional about your life showing up and having a clear purpose. You will walk out of this keynote with a first draft of your personal vision statement. That will be something that you can use that will help you live that purpose. So you know what that purpose is. So I have a quick polling question just to get an idea of who's here today. So we've got a poll here on, in, the, in the chat or in the area. So if you could tell me, are you a technical, technical transformer? Are you one of those brilliant people when I used to work at Microsoft? I worked at Microsoft for 15 years in their global enterprise space, ran my own company a couple of times, worked for VMware. So I've got a quite a broad background and I've been involved and passionate about women in technology for over 25 years. So are you that technically talented transformer? Are you a sales superstar? Are you a marvelous marketing maven? Are you an outstanding operations optimizer? Or maybe you are you some kind of other radical responder that's doing everything you can to make this a better place for yourself and a better place for all of us. So, so go ahead and take the poll and we'll see kind of the mix we have in the room. Okay, it looks like we've got a pretty good mix of folks. That's exciting because it takes all sizes of us, all shapes, all people, all backgrounds and experiences to really make things work for us. So I want you to picture this. So it's a cold, damp, rainy, dreary October Monday in a little town outside of Microsoft called Redmond, Washington. There is a woman on the floor of her bathroom. Of her bathroom. She's got her computer laying beside her. Her phone is laying beside her. She is laying on the floor of her bathroom on that cold floor trying to get up the energy to go to the job that she loves. She has worked 70, 80 hours a week. She's been traveling the world and many times giving up family time because she need, just needed to be at that one more meeting. She's the woman that actually gave up on herself and was so much of a team player that be, she became a doormat and did so much for others that there was never enough for herself. She not only burned the candle at both ends, there was no candle left. She was experiencing major health issues. Her hair was starting to fall out. She gained 25 pounds and regardless of how, much, how well she ate, how much she worked out, what she did, she could not lose that 25 pounds that she gained. She couldn't even go to work each day and she'd put on that happy face, right? There's a commercial about depression where someone goes in and they put on this happy face. That woman was putting on that happy face every day to her families, to her friends, to her coworkers, to her bosses, to her customers, and to herself. Was someone who was actually uh, told by four or five doctors that she had depression, anxiety, she had an anal gland failure, she was suffering some, something called Hashimoto's, a thyroid disease. She was just falling apart at all seams. That woman was me. That was October of 2016 when I had worked at Microsoft to a point where I was no longer myself. I'd given up on me. 
I've given up on my purpose. I've given up on my vision. And because of that experience, I took a four-month sabbatical and I worked on me. I worked on my vision. I worked on my values. I worked on my purpose and what I wanted to do with my life and the legacy I wanted to leave on this world. Because of that, I spent three years doing research, interviewing people for my book. So a lot of what we'll talk about today are things I learned from my research, interviewing over 3,000 259 men and women about what makes great women leaders and what we can do to help each other be strong. At that moment, I made my mission in life, and Huma talked about this, to educate and empower women and girls to be the best they can be in any endeavor they choose and to leave the world a better place for women today, tomorrow, and forever. That was my story. And I use lots of videos and you know all lots of quotes and kind of things, but I really like this one from Ashley Graham. Never let anybody tell you you can't. Be real. Be you. Be your unique self. Be your favorite kind of person. And never let anybody take that job away from you. We're talking today about owning your purpose, owning your wellness, owning your career. This is your life. Own it. So here's our agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges at work today because Wells Fargo just came out with another report. There are a whole variety of reports about what is the current state of women at work. I'm going to talk about that very, very briefly, just so we have a level playing field. Then I'm going to briefly share with you my five ways to be an empowered woman leader that are all in the book. And that we were going to focus specifically on the one about living with intention, purpose, and passion. Because you need both a purpose and you need a passion. You, if you have passion and no purpose, you're going to wake up one day and realize I've in, been in my career for 10 or 15 years. And how did I get here? If you have a purpose and you lack the passion, you're probably not going to do as well as you could have if you combine those things together. You will help. You will start to write your personal vision statement. So you have that purpose that you can live your life with intention targeted specifically at that vision and your purpose. And I'm going to close with having you say, what is one thing I'm going to do to be a more empowered, confident, unstoppable woman in your career and own it? So this day, not just my session, this day is for you. This is about being your best self because everybody else is taken. You can admire someone for maybe the way they dress, the way they talk, maybe the way they do their work. You could admire people, but don't try and imitate them. Try and take the best of them and make that work for you so you can un unlock your full potential and you can own it. It's about learning and thriving every day. We're all going to have our ups and downs, but we need that resiliency, that emotional agility to bounce back when things don't go well. And I've got some tips on that as well. This is about investing yourself. In my 25 years of doing this kind of work, and I started with women's empowerment 25 years ago before it was probably even a word at that time, I've done this question in thousands of places all around the world. So if you imagine for a minute, you have one of those scales where you weigh things, where there's two sides. And so if I was to ask you to put a little weight on that scale, every time you invested in someone else, your family, your children, your community, your boss, your peers, your customers, and you were to put those weights on there, your scale is going to go like this. Now, if I ask you, I want you to put a weight on that scale, every time you invest in yourself, I'm thinking that your scale is still going to look something like this. You're going to have one that's really low in others and one that you're not investing. So things like today is an investment in you. Empower yourself and inspire yourself. You know, it's sort of like they say, you can't motivate people. You can help create a process or a place that can motivate themselves. We can we can empower you unless you want to be empowered and you inspire yourself. Be a difference maker. My vision was always to make a difference and empower women and girls to be the best that they can be. Recently, because of where we are today, I added 
and leave the world a better place for the women today, tomorrow, and forever because we have to leave the world a better place. Our daughters, our sisters, our nieces, our friends deserve better. We wanna change that world and create that world of full equity. And we wanna unleash access to opportunities for you out there. Now I looked up the, you know, Cisco's DEI pillars and the goals of this summit and, you know, changing the equation and pay parity, stand for justice, thriving communities. These things are all really important, but you need to own it. You need to own your purpose, own your wellness, own your career. When I found myself on that bathroom floor, I wasn't owning my wellness. I was no longer up and doing my go outside and breathe and then do a little bit of exercise and do things that made me feel good. I was getting up 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, jumping on my computer, doing email for an hour or so before the kids or the family got up trying to get in a workout, but sometimes it didn't work so well, running to get to the office, working all day, coming home at night. And I wasn't traveling, coming home at night, talking to the family, making dinner, and then getting right back on the computer until 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. I didn't own my wellness and I didn't own my career because rather than being a team player, I became the doormat that did everything for everybody else at the sacrifice for me. So own it. So before I talk about some of the challenges today, I'd like to do a little bit of a word cloud. So if you can think about what are your biggest challenges as a woman today, you don't have to just put in one response in the word cloud, but let's see what you see as some of your biggest challenges today. And I'll give you a minute to go ahead and just whatever comes to mind, advancement opportunities, uh, getting pay equity, whatever comes to mind, getting your voice heard. Let's put all those in the word clouds and I'm gonna ask Huma or someone on the team behind us to kind of tell us what the top three are. So I'll give you a minute to respond. We're gonna do several chat box activities through this. So I'm trying to make this as interactive as possible. We're all live in the same room. So let's see what the challenges are. All right, so. We are getting a few results here. Um, yeah. What do we see? Confidence, work-life balance, burnout, excel at all things, juggling. Yep. Energy, not being heard. Awesome. Thank you. That's perfect. So I'm going to talk about some of where we are today. The What's almost, to me, uh, a little bit scary is the fact that we've actually lost ground since COVID. We were always underpaid, we're still underpaid, and we've actually lost some ground on the pay equity scale. We're underserved in many areas, both in at work, in government, in the amount of dollars spent on men, healthcare for men versus women is one of those things that's way out of balance. We're underserved when it comes to government and various kinds of things. So those are some of the realities that exist today. We are still facing what I call glass ceilings and broken rungs, like a rung on a ladder. Okay. So the other thing we're facing is this bossy bias. Uh, there was something a couple of years ago where people were talking about ban the word bossy. Because you never hear a man leader, regardless of who they are, described as bossy or another word that rhymes with itchy that starts with a B that I won't choose to use. But what's interesting is there was a study done at Harvard with a group of current Harvard students where they were giving two case studies. One case study was about Heidi. The other case study was about Howard. All the facts in the case, even down to the words, exactly the same. The only difference was using the word Heidi or using the name. And when they described Howard, they described him as a strategic thinker, an effective leader, a good decision maker, a team player and collaborative. All these words that were very positive. When they described Heidi, they described her as aggressive, they described her as bossy. They described her as somebody that was indecisive and not able to make a quick decision. The case was the same. When they asked little girls to draw a picture of a leader, nine times out of 10, that little girl drives a man. So we still have some things to work on. 
We also have this double bind paradox that gets into this broken rung. So double bind paradox says that when, when men are advanced in their careers, they get a promotion, whatever that promotion might be, they attain to gain credibility and respect. When women get promoted, many times they become suspect and they have to prove themselves to be a leader at that level. So the broken rungs are things like if I get promoted to be a team leader, I have to earn my way through performance and show that I'm capable to be ready for that next job. Research also shows that men are many times promoted based on potential and women are based on performance. So I may get promoted, but I might it might take me a year or two longer to get there because I don't have the potential. I have to prove myself for performance. Lean in found that through since COVID, one in four women are considering downsizing their career in some way or leaving the workforce altogether for a variety of reasons, some to start their own businesses and some just because it, they just can't balance the work life or what's going on for them. But it is a fact. And the thing is that women's lack of pay, uh, women still earn about 81 cents for a Caucasian woman on a dollar. African-American women will earn like 76 cents. And some Hispanic women can earn as little as 56 cents on a dollar. And it's about 65 cents for uh, Pan-Asian women. So we're still learning less for the same job. And then finally, this is something that we control, the imposter syndrome and perfectionism. So I'm going to share some things at the end, as long as we have time, about perfectionism and the imposter syndrome. But in essence, perfectionism comes from the time we're little girls. And we have what I call the good girl syndrome. I grew up with a brother, four years older than me, and I was the I had the good girl syndrome. I always wanted to be the good girl. I always wanted to please my dad. I, I was told to be the good girl, go to the good school, get the good grades, have the good friends, get a good job, find a good significant other. It was always the good girl that my brother was never subject to. So if I came home with an A minus or my like, oh, heaven forbid, I came home with a B. It was a tragedy in my house. If my brother came home with a C, he got to go to ice cream. But that imposter syndrome is something we control something we can do something about. It's having that sense that I'm not good enough. I'm not ready. So I'm going to give you the tools and the resources today and, and through this whole event to help you be that unstoppable, unstoppable woman leader. So in my research, all these, all these people, I found these five things that kept emerging. So the number one is about being strong and being your best self. It's finding the strengths that make you who you are. So whatever your role, whether you're a programmer, whether you're a marketing person, whether you're in HR, whatever your role is, it's being strong and being yourself and it's learning those things. So I encourage you, if you haven't taken, a My if you haven't done a Myers-Briggs or a DISC or an Insights or done Strength Finder, take one of those instruments and find your strengths and then find career opportunities that fit those strengths. Right. We're going to spend a lot of time on the second one, stand up and live with intention. In order to stand up, you have to have something to stand on. That will be your personal vision that you will write the first draft today. And then stand out, be valuable, be visible, be vocal. Valuable means that if you are a programmer, if you are an infrastructure specialist, if you're an architect, whatever your role, if you're if you're in marketing, if you're in programming, if you're in program management, become valuable, take courses, seminars, get certificates, get your accreditation, things you need to do to be great at your job. And then be visible. So I was watching TV this morning in my hotel room and there's a woman on there who's uh, the first woman Navy admiral ever. She's an African-American woman. And when they interviewed her, they said, well, what it's, what's it like to be the first? And she said, I want to make sure that I'm not the last. And she talked about being visible, sitting in the front of the room, being visible in those meetings, whether they're over WebEx or whatever technology or they're in person, take a seat at that table. If someone tells you those seats are only for the vice presidents or presenters, then you can apologize and say, I didn't know. But people who sit visibly on that table in the room get heard 
Those people who are sitting on the chairs on the side of the room sometimes don't get heard. On Zoom or WebEx, what that means is turn your video on. You only have to dress nice from the waist up. Uh, one of the things I did during COVID is I invented, invested in a lot of inexpensive Kohl's and Penny's necklaces and tops because nobody sees I'm sitting here in my jeans and my tennis shoes because I look like I'm professional from up here. Make sure your camera angle makes you the same size of everybody else. Don't sit in the meeting like this with your head down or look small. Confidence comes from space. Height and space and taking up physically and mentally and verbally and non-verbally the room. So take up your space and be vocal. Take a seat at that table. Ask for the agenda ahead of time for the next all hands meetings. Prepare some questions so people know who you are and say, hi, I'm Patty Grimm and I'm from Dallas, Texas. I have a question about whatever, right? Put yourself number one on your things to do list. I'm going to say this twice. Self care is not selfish. It is survival. Self care is not selfish, it's survival. When I was on that floor, I couldn't help my family. I couldn't even make dinner. Because I could, I would read a recipe and I couldn't even make dinner because I was so down on myself and everything. You see the picture of the lovely Michelle that has a link to my book on Amazon. I'm not gonna promote the book. It's just up to you if you'd like to get it. And the final one is pay, pay it forward and leave the world a better place. So we're gonna focus on this one and we're gonna get real specific. What is it? What does living with intention mean to you? So I want you to put comments in the chat box, right? So in the chat box, just write in, what does living with intention mean to you? And I'll give you 30 seconds to start writing some stuff and then I'll ask uh, Huma to uh, call out a few things. What does living with intention mean to you? Happy to purpose. What else? I know there's lots of you out there. Let's see some things. What does living with intention mean to you? Having a goal. Knowing where you're headed. Being purposeful. Being able to do what you need to do. So what's interesting is that when you live with intention, your life is a series of choices that you make with a purpose. And I'm going to give you some concrete examples of where I've done that or where I've seen others do that lives. When you live with intention, you activate a chemistry in your brain. And you're not just letting things flow or happen in your life. And you have happy brain boosts all these wonderful endorphins and things that give you energy to get through the day. So living with intention is living with a plan. It's about making stuff happen to you and for you, staying on your path and not letting go of life's distractions. So in my career, I took several roles outside of what I would consider my strength or my comfort zone because I needed that experience, but I stayed in that role for a year to 18 months. One of those roles when I decided to go help with the launch of Windows 7. And I will tell you, that was the hardest 18 months of my life. And I learned so much. I learned so much about so many things. And I also learned that that was not part of my purpose and plan but I needed that experience to broaden out my career. And as soon as I was available and ready, I started looking for other things that fit with my purpose and intention. So there are five areas to live with intention. There's physical intention. That's the wellness thing. You're gonna hear from doctors. That's taking care of yourself, making sure you eat, pray, love. You do the things you need to do to keep you physically active wherever you are and whatever your physical abilities might be. 
there's mental and emotional intention. There's a wonderful YouTube by Dr. Susan David about embracing change and embracing emotional agility and emotional uh, emotional agility. It's a great YouTube video. I can send that to the team and they can send it out as a follow-up if necessary. But it's, it's a wonderful video about having emotional agility, the agility to go through life's ups and downs, to experience them in all their glory, their good, their bad, the ugly. And learning from those things so that you don't get do it again. It's that bouncing back, right? They say it's not how you fall, it's how high you bounce back. I'm going to give you a technique to really leverage that as well called an after action review. There's self-intention. There's being intentional to others and then there's spiritual intentions. So being intentional means being deliberate. Being very conscious about your values and beliefs. So you live your life in alignment with those things. I will tell you when I worked in, in technology, when I work in my own business today, because I do leadership development, coaching, teaming, a lot of women's uh, empowerment stuff. When I work with a client, I really look with that client and see, do their, do, is what they're trying to accomplish in alignment with my beliefs and my values, my intention, my purpose? I have turned work down from very, for very large clients that wanted me to come in and do some team building and make everybody feel happy, but they weren't going to create the culture to support what they were asking me to do. I've turned down several large contracts because of that. Every job I took at Microsoft, I took with intention. I was deliberate about what I did. And sometimes I didn't even know it, right? For example, when I was uh, at Microsoft about 10, 11 years, my son had gone off to college. I looked at my husband and said, gee, I would love to take an international assignment. What do you think about moving to Europe or Asia? And he looked at me and said, sounds cool. So literally, I took a job in Asia. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes because it was in alignment with what my purpose and values and beliefs and what I wanted to do. You need to prepare yourself and set yourself up for intentional success. The same time you want to make sure you're serving others to make the world a better place. As they said in the video, we want to all lift all boats up. We want everybody to rise to be successful. There's a great quote by Madeleine Albright, the former Secretary of State of the United States, who said there should be a special place, excuse me, in hell for women who don't help other women succeed. And you need to be accountable to live your life your way. So it's about living with intention, but that personal vision is the center of that. It brings together your passions, your purpose, your calling. This is my calling. This is my career and this is my life. So there's the five circles of intention, but it all centers on having a personal vision. You have to know your why and define that vision and values that bring you joy. Set some realistic short-term and long-term goals. Really remove people, places, and things that get in your way. Fill your boat up with people that lift you up. And those people who are trying to always put you down, you may not be able to eliminate them out of your life, especially if they're family, but you just minimize your impact with them. And if they say things, you just learn like a duck to have it float off your back, like water off of a duck's back. Take care of yourself. Self-care is not selfish. It is survival. You can't pour from an empty teacup. Like they say on the airlines, when the emergency happens, put your mask on first because you can't help your child or the person next to you if you can't breathe. You have to take care of yourself. So I want you to think about what drives you to do what you do with passion. You can put that in the chat. I'm going to keep rolling. What's the destiny you want to leave in the world? When you go on and take another assignment, what do you want people to say about you? Or when you leave the room, do they say, Patty is a really great leader, but dot, 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 fill in the blanks, which is a little bit too pushy. What, is, what do people say about you? What do you do that brings you passion? And I encourage you to tell you today to think about this all day. What's the destiny you want to leave in the world? So I'm going to help you create a vision statement. So a personal vision statement or a vision statement in general 
It's something that's about a statement about who you want to be. The kind of leader, the kind of person you want to be. It's a desired future state. That's probably better than where you are today. I want to be that dedicated, compassion, respected, amazing leader. It's a roadmap to guide your why. It's a signpost to keep you on course when you get off track. When I was in that Windows 7 role about six months before I was ready to move on to a new role, I had to go back to my vision and really say, how do I get myself back on course? What is my signpost? What is my destiny? It's a gauge to align your action and a compass to keep you on track. So I'm going to very quickly go through these couple of slides. So vision statements started a couple hundred years ago, back in ancient times, when they did a lot of studies in, in Denmark and Sweden around what makes one country strong versus another, especially when they looked at like Egypt, Rome, Greece, the UK, and even the US. What made them successful? Because they started in countries that had nothing, no resources, and that they dedicated the world. Dr. Viktor Frankl, many people have read this book on the on man's search for meaning. He looked at why some people survived concentration camps and others did not. And the number one reason is they had something to live for after they got out of the, co the concentration camps. We have the John Kennedy put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. They did that in July of, 20, of 1969, six months ahead of schedule. Jean-Claude Keeley made it very, uh, um, very, popular in sports with his vision of going down skiing and winning the gold medal. You have people like Bill Gates and, and Steve Jobs. Bill Gates' vision was to create a place where everybody could be have access to everything they needed or to make the world a better place and change the way the world works. We have the wonderful Mary Kay, who had two visions. One, to make every woman feel beautiful. Two, to create a way for women to earn their own money. So I'm going to have you I'll start to think about your own vision statement. I want you to imagine for a minute and even close your eyes for just a second and imagine you're going to be on your favorite TV show or your favorite podcast or your favorite show that you happen to listen to on the radio, whatever, wherever you do. And I want you to think about yourself as a, as a leader in five years in that role. What do you want that story to say about you? And I want you to close your eyes and imagine you're surrounded by your friends and family on the Ellen show or uh, the Kelly Clarkson show nowadays. And you're surrounded by your friends and family and they're talking about you, your bosses, your peers. What words are they saying? She is dedicated. She is smart. She is respected. She's talented. She's compassionate. She's a developer of people. I want you to write all those words down and put them in the chat box. But think about the words or adjectives that come to mind. So what you'll do over the course of the next 30 days is I want you to revisit these words at least once a week and add new words. Take away a few words. Add some things that maybe you see that's important to you and to create a draft vision statement of about 10 to 16 words or less. That is your purpose. That is your intention. My vision statement is Patty is a respected, dedicated compassionate woman leader who makes a difference and leaves the world a better place. I want you to create a actual vision statement. And over the next 30 days, refine it. When you finalize that statement, I want you to print it out. I want you to put it on your computer. I want you to put it on your bathroom wall, in your office, in your car, on your phone, everywhere. Because little girls with dreams because become women with visions. Now you want to put it to action, apply it, use it in your life. Ask yourself, am I living my vision? Am I living the person I want to be? Am I living with intention? Use it to make career decisions. When I had that choice of going, of taking an international assignment, I had two job offers, one in EMEA, running the business excellence team in Central Eastern Europe, living in Germany, one in Asia, running the Asia Pacific customer partner experience team. I chose Asia. I called my husband from our big international sales conference and said, honey, you have four weeks to pack the house. We're moving to overseas. He said, do I pack flip-flops or snowshoes? I said, pack flip-flops. We're moving to Singapore. And here's why. Asia had a thousand people on the corporate headquarters staff. I would be this little teeny fish in a big pond of a thousand people trying to help make a difference in those 26 countries. Asia 
had 160 people for 26 countries. That was even more diverse than than and than Europe because of places like India with multiple time zones or the, the diversity of the languages and things. So I picked Asia because I had a better chance to make a difference, use it to get back on track. Anytime I fall off the track, I revisit it because vision without action is a dream. Action without vision merely passes the time. Vision without action can change the world and so can you. So one very quick thing before I want to close and have time for Q&A. So I talked about this thing about eliminate perfectionism. I want you to learn to say no. So perfectionism, put this in your brain, is a personality trait by someone with overly high performance expectations combined with me being overly critical and caring too much what people think. Many, many women will make a presentation for a meeting and they will absolutely rock it. And someone will say, Patty, that was great. What do most women say? I could have done better. I forgot to say this. Learn to say thank you and strive for excellence, not perfectionism and get rid of that good girl syndrome. Learn the power of, oh, well, let it go. So if things didn't go so well, oh, well, or let it go, and then learn from it. Understand the difference between being a team player and a doormat. When does it go too far when you're sacrificing your own goals, your career, your family, your time for everybody else and not taking care of yourself? And practice an after-action review. So one of the women I interviewed for my book was Colonel Deb Lewis, good friend of mine. I just talked to her the other day. She retired from the military after a 30-year career, now lives in Hawaii. And she and she taught me this after-action review that comes to the military. So if something doesn't go well in that meeting, if you say something that you didn't mean to say or something just didn't go well, ask yourself these questions. What happened? What did it happen? What did I learn from it? And what would I do differently if I could do it again? Or how could I do it better? If something goes well, what did I learn? What happened? What did I learn? What would I do again to create the same or a better result? So final thoughts. I want to help you play to your strengths, stand up with that vision and live your life with intention. Stand out by being more valuable, visible, and vocal. Put yourself number one on your things to do list and pay it forward so we leave the world a better place. So last thing, and you need to do this all day long. She remembered who she was. She remembered her purpose, her passion, her vision, and the game changed. So what's one thing you're gonna do to be a unstoppable leader? You notice the red and cross out of woman. I look forward to the day we could simply say she is a great leader and not say she's a great woman leader or she's a great African-American woman leader or she's a great Hispanic leader or a great Pan-Asian leader. I want to look forward to the day when we just say she is a great leader. So what's the one thing you're going to do? Now, you can put that in the chat if you'd like. That would be great. And then I'm going to turn it back over for some Q&A. Now, just go do it. Okay, so if we have some q and A, I, I'm hoping we still have a little few times, and then I have a couple of little couple things in closing, and then we're hopefully we're having an awesome rocking day. All right. Well, thank you so much, Patty. This was one tangible advice, full of wisdom and um, action items for, and I'm I'm hoping that our global women of uh, Cisco community has thoroughly enjoyed this keynote session. Thank you so much for that. Uh, be a difference maker. That's a powerful statement. Be your favorite kind of women. Don't let anyone else take that job. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of minutes for questions. Since the content was so important, we decided to uh, shorten the time that we will be taking in the Q&A. So I will just take one question from the audience. Uh, you highlighted a lot about self-care. You mentioned, you know, self-care is not selfish, it's survival. So what would be your one advice for women who want to take care of themselves, you know, who want to take that sabbatical, but something is really stopping them. 
not to take an action. So what would be your advice for, for that, um, for that woman who is holding back? Thanks. Thanks. And that's a great question. So we all can't, we all can't take a sabbatical, right? I happen to have been at Microsoft 15 years and I was entitled to one. So I was able to take that. The other, I think the thing I would mention were a couple of very, very practical things. Schedule time on your calendar for lunch, 20 to 30 minutes every day on your calendar, walk away from your computer, get out of your office, walk out of your whatever space you use, physically get out of that room for 15 to 30 minutes to actually eat and re-nourish your body. And if you can, go outside. Like I, I highly recommend you got to put it on your calendar because if it's not on your calendar, you're going to, just like I did, you're going to work right through lunch and on your computer. The IT people would come by my desk and say, oh my God, this is full of, you know, food crumbs and stuff. Cause I had 99% of the time went downstairs, grabbed lunch, went back upstairs to my office, take time for yourself and put it on your calendar or just take a, 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 a couple of hours, a break, go do something you love, get your hair done, get, go read a book, go take a walk, go walk your dog, go hug your cat or your kids. And I would also very practically suggest we, you schedule between every two or three meetings, virtual or in person, a five minute break, 10 minutes preferred, five minute break, again, walk away from your computer, Go outside or at least get into another environment. Maybe you enjoy your garden or something. Go outside and take in fresh air. Research, I'm a research geek. Research shows that five minutes, that seven minutes, that 10 minutes break away from the environment will help you solve the problem you're trying to solve. That increases your brain productivity. Just like how I said, living with intention activates all those positive endorphins in your brain you have to regenerate those things. If not, you'll find yourself nine o'clock at night still sitting at your computer uh, and it's just, it's not healthy. All right, thank you, Patty. That's wonderful advice. Uh, before we wrap up this session, I just wanted to announce that we have uh, 10 copies that we of uh, Patty's book, Quiet Women Never Change History. We'll be, dispu we'll be distributing those. And uh, this is a, you know, really gr great closure to, and moving on to our next session that my um, amazing uh, Women of Impact uh, co-lead uh, and member, Shelly will be uh, presenting. So let's move on to that wellness session and thank you everyone for, for joining this and bye from here. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon all. We want to welcome you to the holistic wellness session for the Women of Impact, our flagship event and our 10th anniversary. My name is Shelley Stevens, Chief of Staff for the Women of Cisco. I am thrilled to be with you, here with you today. It is an honor to introduce to you Ted Kezios, VP of Wellness and Global Benefits. Ted? Thank you so much, Shelley, and hello, everyone. It is an honor to be here for the Women of Impact 2022 event. I'm extremely excited to see all of you. And at Cisco, we're always striving to realize the best version of ourselves, and that includes how we collaborate and lead people. It all starts with our own holistic well-being, though, so we're here to talk about that today. And it's so important today because we're getting hit with so many different things as part of our environment. Not only the pandemic, but social justice, wars, our devastation in Turkey and Syria, and ongoing caregiving and health needs. So it all is part of that. And, you know, it's funny because this question always comes up, Ted, do you, do you refer to it as wellness or well-being? 
And it's okay to use those interchangeably. My simple definition is I think our journey with wellness started with wellness as physical wellness. So nutrition, exercise, sleeping, and then we've evolved over time to be more holistic. So we started referring to it as well-being, and that includes physical, emotional, social, and financial. But I think the simple way is it's all about holistic well-being. And that word is really important because it actually ties to a recent poll for the Women of Cisco America's membership. And in that poll, it revealed three top of mind topics that we wanted to cover today. Wellness of the body, wellness of the mind, and workplace balance. And that last one kind of encapsulates everything, including financial and social. So I'm joined today by leading experts to help us navigate on how we look at holistic wellness. So I'm gonna do the three introductions. The first one is I'd like to introduce Dr. Aliyah Yaku, who is the Chief Medical Officer at Thrive Global, one of Cisco's wellbeing partners. Thank you for your partnership. She's a board certified internal medicine physician with years of experience in tech, medicine, and mental health. She's champions and upstream approach, which I just love, to include prevention and habit formation, and is passionate about empowering and supporting working entre women entrepreneurs. Dr. Aliyah, would you mind saying hello? Hi, everyone, and thank you for the warm welcome, Ted. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about you know, a, a topic that is both near and dear to my heart personally, but also as a fellow woman and someone who comes from the medical background, I hear these questions often. So really excited to, uh, to join this conversation. Thank you, doctor. Our second panelist is Rachel Williams, who's a workplace wellness expert and founder of Zest Lifestyle. I just love her LinkedIn title, title which is Chief Vitality Officer. Until 2004, she worked in marketing and events at telecoms industry, and then since then has been working with organizations who recognize that looking after their employees' mental and physical well-being brings real business benefits. Rachel, could you say hello? Hi, everyone from England, and thank you so much for inviting me on this panel to take part with all these wonderful people. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel, and thank you for being here with us. Our third panelist is Dr. Summer Allen, who's an expert in the areas of diversity and inclusion, emotional intelligence, organization change, and leadership development. She's founder and managing partner of Premier Performance Consulting, an international management consulting firm that specializes in improving organizational and employee performance. Dr. Allen's worked with Cisco for numerous years, co-facilitating next-gen leaders under the Centers for Workforce Excellence. Thank you for your partnership, Dr. Allen, and welcome. Thank you so much, Ted, and the rest of the panelists. Um, hello to each and every one of you. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, as um, Dr. Leah said a few moments ago, as a woman and someone that sits in this space, really excited to engage with each and every one of you in these conversations that are so vital to the way in which we show up and the success of our organization. So happy to be here, Ted. Excellent. Thank you. I love the energy from all of our panelists. I appreciate it. All right, let's begin. We'll start with some research. Gallup's 2022 State of Global Workplace report states that worker stress has reached a record high for the second year in a row. 44% of respondents are feeling a lot of daily stress at work. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Alia Yaku. What is work-related stress and how does it impact overall well-being? Great question. I think we've all experienced this at one point or another. We hear this term stress all the time. Whether we're talking about work-related stress or not, I think it's all somewhat interconnected in the sense that, you know, stress is something that's actually acute. It's something that happens to us in the moment. And so no matter where we are uh, in circumstance, uh, socioeconomic uh, or otherwise, Every single human on this planet experiences acute stress. It's when that stress becomes cumulative or chronic that it really takes a toll on our health and starts wearing away at our mental health, at our physical health. We know that long-term stress, of course, leads to all of those chronic medical conditions we want to avoid. And so at Thrive, what we've really tried to do is teach people how to disrupt that 
stress in the moment so that it doesn't become cumulative and chronic. And that includes a lot of uh, really easy sort of strategies that you can uh, use and tools that you can use in the moment. They can be things as simple as, you know, taking a walk and helping yourself reset, doing some breathing exercises, saying a positive affirmation. But uh, but absolutely correct that this is a global issue that has not only um, reared its ugly head, but that has become much more prevalent as time has gone on and through the uncertainty uh, of the pandemic. And there are a lot of things that I'm sure we'll be discussing um, today to talk about how we can sort of get this under control and disrupt it. Hey, doctor, you know, I, I love what you said with regards to sort of disrupting in the moment. Can you talk a little bit about sort of resets and what Thrive does along those lines? Yes, and we're we've been so lucky to partner with Cisco on this and bringing this to leaders at Cisco. But basically, what we found when we looked at the literature, the scientific literature, was that when we're stressed, our sympathetic nervous system is activated. Most of us recognize that as that flight or a fight or flight response. Right, your palms might be sweaty. Your um, stomach may be acting up, you may have a headache, your thoughts are racing, you're sort of kind of on edge. Uh, and that, you know, is how stress manifests in the moment. Sometimes there are other manifestations too, but we can course correct from that stress. It only takes 60 to 90 seconds, if you believe that, but that's how long it takes for the nervous system to reset. And so at Thrive, what we did is we created something called the reset, which is a 60 to 90 second short little video. Uh, there are different types of videos, some really uh, sort of take advantage of visual imagery. So if you're an animal person, you might enjoy watching some beautiful scenery of animals, or if you like travel, you might enjoy uh, sort of transporting yourself mentally to a different destination. But pairing that with some breathing exercises always is a great idea and a great way to dis disrupt that stress in the moment. So we have hundreds of examples of uh, resets that are available on the Thrive platform that people can take advantage of. And my personal favorite is actually creating your own reset. So I put together uh, a grouping of my favorite photos of my family and quotes and places I've been. And I can't tell you, 60 seconds really does feel like a little mental vacation. So I highly encourage everyone in the room um, to see if they can take advantage of this and do uh, 60 seconds of a deep breathing exercise. Thank you, doctor. I even did my 60 seconds before this session and I looked oh, over at my you. family photo to my left. So uh, it works. Uh, thank you so much. And, and I also appreciate what you said around, you know, just life stressors. You know, I think we we all get hung up a little bit of, you know, is it work? Is it personal stress? And, you know, with everything coming at us, it's just life stress these days. And it's it's life balance. It's not work life balance anymore because it all blends together. So I like some of those comments around the integration of that. All right, moving on. Another study caught my eye because actually we've done some well-being surveys here within our Cisco population uh, five to six times now. And it showed the same thing, which is while everyone is experiencing a lot of stress, both men and women, it showed that women feel more stressed. And so the McKinsey 2022 Women in the Workplace report showed that women at all levels are experiencing a higher level of stress including levels of burnout and exhaustion, and more so than men. There's that word, burnout. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you, Rachel, with regards to a question on burnout. Is burnout classified now as a disease? I think I read something about that. And how can I, individuals, specifically women, manage burnout? Yes, it is. Um... The uh, World Health Organization defines burnout as a, as a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. Um, so I guess what we have to do is, is what is the difference between stress and burnout? Well, stress comes and goes and is usually quite short term, but prolonged stress can lead to, to burnout. And burnout kind of creeps up upon us and uh, progresses gradually over time. So if you think about it, we've been through a lot the past few years. The pandemic has changed everything. Uh, we've had to navigate the new normal in how we live and how we work. And for many of us, it's blurred the lines between work and home life. 
And also in this, this changing world, priorities of what women want and need out of a job have changed more money, better job satisfaction, working with people who are cared about in their current situation. And, you know, what happens when life has a habit of throwing a, a curveball? And also other challenges uh, affecting women in the workplace, uh, such as juggling, bringing up a family together with the demands of work. Uh, if you're a midlife woman, you might be in what we call the sandwich generation, uh, where you, you're looking after kids or maybe teenage kids and you're looking after aging uh, parents as well at the same time. Or you might be a single parent um, having to cope with some of this or all of this. Uh, then we also need to look at our mental and our physical health and um, what women have to deal with while still working. Um, so issues such as infertility, postnatal depression, endometriosis and, and menopause. So women are looking for looking um, more to sort of looking after their, their health and well-being. And um, I think it's really important that uh, we all understand what the uh, symptoms of burnout and stress are. Uh, and they can manifest themselves in sort of physical, mental, and emotional and behavioural uh, symptoms. So if you think about like headaches or pains, um, muscle tension, uh, problems with concentration, low mood or emotional numbness, uh, anxiety and depression, reduced sleep, uh, overwhelm, uh, irritability, alienation and feeling detached, exhaustion, uh, a lack of joy or purpose in life or increased cynicism in most things in their life. Um, so it's important that if you're suffering from any of these things that uh, you seek help or start to have a strategy where you start to look after yourself. And um, some of the things that uh, Dr. Alaya um, touched on are the things that you can do uh, if you recognise that you're suffering from burnout. But I think the number one thing is to is to write it down. What specifically is happening? What are your stressors? Uh, what are the triggers? What's the cause of this this burnout or this stress? And then make an action list of of what you can do to look after yourself and to deal with the problem. Uh, it's also important to communicate with someone. So get support from um, your manager, a colleague, or even a therapist, or even your employee assistance program. And also look after number one, make self-care an absolute priority. And I will say, work with what I call the five pillars of vitality, which are what is the mainstay of, of, of my business. Eat, sleep, move, think and pause. And they're all inextricably linked. So eat, what can you do to nourish yourself and feed yourself healthily? Sleep, what needs to happen to improve your sleep? Uh, do you need to have a regular bedtime? Do you need to reduce uh, caffeine and alcohol? Or do you need to reduce the use of your tech? Um, move, do some form of exercise. Dr. Eli was talking about um, getting outside for fresh air for a walk, or uh, you could do something like a calming yoga session, or maybe it's a gym session that you want. And then moving on to think, um, we've already mentioned about talking to someone, a mindfulness session, exactly what Dr. Elia um, said, journaling um, or breathing exercises, and then pause. Uh, what do you need to, to do to take time out to recover? Is it just regular breaks in your day or do you need to stop or pause something um, in your li life? And it's important to set boundaries as well. Say no to some things and obviously say yes to self-care. Um, so it is really important that you do look after yourself when you recognise the, the signs of burnout. I, I love all those tips, Rachel, um, especially that pause one. I think it's so important and, you know, even when it comes to work, what we're trying to do within our team is we're trying to look at sort of the scope of the work. So setting boundaries, you know, 
it, does the scope need to be this or is it this? Is the timing, you know, do you need that this week or could it be next week? So even those things that can help with sort of just rethinking the work and understanding where you can create better boundaries is really helpful. Um, I also read a, a, an article I thought I have to uh, I have to study. It, it was a great study, female quotient called the Resilience Reset. And it, it was, I, I highly recommend this again, female quotient called the Resilient Reset. And it captures in insights in the state of resilience for working women. And it stated, for example, 66% of working moms agree they were responsible for most childcare and household duties in addition to their job during the pandemic. And so I thought that was fascinating because there's this extra burden with regards to working moms um, who are in caregiving situations and in, in uh, the household. So thank you so much for that. Now let's switch gears. We've been talking a lot about individuals. So let's switch gears to employers. And I was in complete agreement with this next article in Fast Company's article, and I love the title, why it, why, why it's time for every company to become a wellness company. And it posed that companies that adapted to evolving employee needs saw the highest performance through the pandemic. In fact, 83% of companies that increased employee morale reported increased revenue uh, as high as 2.8 times higher than companies that experienced decreased morale. So I'm going to come to you now, Dr. Summer Allen. Dr. Allen, why is it time for every company now to become a wellness company? And how does DE&I, I love this topic of DE&I, how does DE&I and belonging in the workplace culture play a role in this? Oh, thank you so much for that question, Ted. And I just want to start off by saying thank you for intentionally inserting diversity, inclusion, and belonging into this wellness conversation. Um, because what we identify is there is a definite correlation between emotional well-being and diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And so when we talk about organizations becoming a wellness company, what that means is taking a holistic perspective of really understanding what the needs are of each and every one of our employees. When we think about taking that holistic perspective of really understanding our employees, what we must be mindful of is that our identities come into the workplace with us. Who we are as individuals comes into the workplace with us. And so when we talk about wellness, uh, we want to look at the impact that the culture of our organizations play on how we are able to show up. And so when we think about that, research tells us that mental health and wellness and diversity and inclusion are directly connected with one another. And so when we think about even burnout, as, as Rachel mentioned a few moments ago, uh, what the research and data tells us is that we must identify and understand that employees who come from diverse backgrounds, they face what we call an emotional tax. And what we mean by that is when we have a, when we, when we have a lack of representation, or when our culture infuses in microaggressions or unconscious buyers, that creates stressors. And so when we have those stressors in our organizational spaces, that impacts the mental health and the psychological safety of those that we work with. And so the piece that we want to look at is that mental health is often a symptom of lackluster diversity, equity, and inclusion within an organization. And so if we look at being a wellness company, we must also analyze our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, culture aspects in order to see our people feeling that they can show up and be their whole selves. Now, why is that important? And so regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, or even sexual orientation, a majority felt and the majority, majority of employees feel that they have experienced barriers to inclusion. Now, if I come to work and I don't feel like I'm included, again, that is an emotional stressor. I love that you referenced the McKinsey Women in the Workplace Research um, because what that does is supports the argument that certain demographics are more likely to feel less included. As a result of feeling less included, again, that's where that burnout comes in and those stressors come into play. Now, when we really dissect that information among those groups, entry-level employees, women, and ethnic and racial minorities are hit even harder. And so as we talk about this panel today, what we want to look at is what are some of those 
aspects of our culture that may be impacting us. And so when we talk about the big stressors, it's when individuals feel isolated or alone. And what we can do to look at how to mitigate that is for each and every one of us to look past and look at our intersectionality and become allies to one another, um, for leaders to even be more aware. And so that's really what we want to identify when we talk about true overall organizational wellness um, as a true initiative in our organizational spaces. Dr. Allen, there's so much there that you just shared. And, and I, I think I sort of take a step back as a global benefits leader for an employer. And, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot with this question, but like, where, where should we start? Do you have any tips for where employers and specifically the global benefits function should start with like how to actually drive DEI through uh, our processes, et cetera? I love that. Uh, there's so many ways to start. The first thing that we always encourage organizations to do is start with simple, courageous conversations. Now, oftentimes people say that's an oxymoron, a simple, courageous conversation. But really what that is saying is allowing a safe space for our employees to just share their experiences. It's hard to start creating strategy around things that we don't understand. And so when we allow our employees to share their lived experiences in the workplace and where they're finding barriers or where they're feeling, um, you know, places of depression and anxiety based off of identity, then we have a starting point for us. And so creating discussion groups, creating these types of um, panels where people can go into the chat and share their experiences, but also allowing employees to understand that leaders are really intentionally listening and that what they share, A, will be held in confidence and will actually be addressed. And so from that, we can then identify the data points to be able to create true strategy around um, true diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. It's just, those are some great uh, suggestions and gosh, it boils down to something really simple, which is get more proximate with our people, right? Get more proximate and, and lean in as leaders and, and employees because we all help one another. And I really like what you said about safe space. Um, we do have a site here at Cisco called a uh, hashtag safe to talk. And it's a, it's a safe uh, um, sort of social event where we can allow people to share some of their stories and, and open up the conversation and that boy that reduces stigma, right? All right, thank you so much, Dr. Allen. Okay, we're moving now to one of my favorite sections of all panels, which is what I call rapid fire. Um, so we're going to do a, um, I'm going to try to do probably two, three questions, and I'll just sort of call on uh, certain panel experts. And uh, you have sort of, if you can keep it to under three minutes with your answers, that would be great. And then I'll kind of touch on at least two of you with each question. So Dr. Aliyah Yaku, I'm going to start with you. Menopause is a hot topic. I, I personally and our team has received a lot of questions with regards to that. So we're beginning to you know, formulate more resources in the area of menopause. How do hormones impact people's day to day and how do we destigmatize menopause? Thank you so much, Ted, for bringing this up. This has been the sort of silent elephant in the room for many women. We know from the research that menopausal women actually are one of the fastest growing groups in the workplace, and they experience a ton of manifestations of this transition in their lives that uh, traditionally they, they haven't felt comfortable sharing. And so the first is, you know, I think we all collectively need to understand what this transition looks like. It is very uh, sort of um, impactful for women going through it. So including things like hot flashes, um, emotional ups and downs, brain fog is one of the most common things we hear about that impacts people directly in terms of their work and decreases their confidence, um, especially if they're going into a meeting or they have a big event uh, or need to send out a memo and they're they're experiencing that symptom. So just a couple of the, the top uh, sort of symptoms that women experience. Uh, in terms of destigmatizing it, I think one of the best things we can do is what we're doing here, which is just start talking about it. Start talking about it, make it a normal thing that we talk about, that we share about. Uh, the more that women can feel empowered to talk about it in the workplace and especially with their managers, um, the better off we will all be. And if you're a manager and you have a woman on your 
team who may be going through something like this and, and perhaps you don't know anything about menopause, that's okay, first of all, just sort of being an active listener is kind of the biggest thing. And then being supportive and asking questions like, how can I support you? It sounds like there are a lot of things um, that may be happening that are impacting um, sort of uh, the way that you're feeling. What can I do to be there for you and to be the most supportive? And so it's sometimes about asking them what they need rather than saying, you know, being prescriptive or suggesting something. But I think the most important thing is to have these conversations and also create an avenue for maybe some flexibility if it's needed. We have flexibility for all sorts of other um, sort of times in a person's life uh, when they're going through a big uh, transitional uh, stage. Um, and this is kind of another one that's huge. So if we can be supportive, I think that's that's the best thing. Thank you, thank you. All right, Rachel, anything to add? Yes, I mean, I think educating men on menopause, um, that's kind of quite big in the UK now uh, to help them understand um, what we're going through. But it is an education uh, process for women as well as they become perimenopausal as well. It, it can take people by surprise. I knew it took me by surprise. <laughs> it was like being hit by freight freight train. Um, so it was a big learning curve. So, um, you know, having to deal with sleep deprivation and just feeling tired the whole time and this hormonal roller coaster. So I think education is key uh, for people who are going through it, as well as people who are just about to go through it. And for, for men as well. So it is having that supportive culture that we can em embrace to help uh, women transition through this uh, period of time in their life. Thank you. I'm, I'm reading and I'm learning on this. And uh, it's such an important topic, Dr. Allen. I, I have to hit all three of our, our leading experts here today on the same topic. Anything to add on menopause? Oh, I really appreciate that, Ted. Um, I will give this caveat. I have not reached pen menopausal state yet. However, I am going through a hormonal roller coaster in my 40s. And so I just wanted to give that runway for those of you all out there on this journey with you. And so one of the things I, I often like to talk to my clients about is as a practitioner in emotional intelligence, I'll talk from a personal perspective. The key is about our own self-awareness, about understanding the changes that we're experiencing um, as Dr. Leah mentioned earlier, in our mood, in our in our ability to, to handle stress, in our ability to be as sharp with things. And so oftentimes we look at these things that are happening to us in life and, and we don't necessarily pay attention that there's something happening in my body, right? There's something that is taking place that is actually a little bit out of my control. And so one of the things that we wanna look at when it comes to the self-awareness is being mindful of what is truly taking place within us and giving ourselves some grace and mercy in that. And so giving ourselves some grace and mercy around what's happening and understanding is truly a part of my journey. It's a part of my identity. And as a result of that, again, having those simple courageous conversations and talking to other women about it. My girlfriends and I, we actually got together a few weekends ago and we had kind of what we call the a hormonal weekend. And we just talked about all of the things that we're experiencing. And we found that one of the things is that we had a lot more in common that we just had never discussed as close girlfriends. And so how about bringing that same type of heightened sense of awareness and sharing into our organizational spaces so we can support one another as we go through our journeys? Thank you so much. I'm just smiling here. Grace and mercy and hormonal weekend. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Such an important topic. All right. I hate to leave that one, but we're going to have to, you know, we've talked a lot about, we've talked about employers, we've talked about individuals. Let's switch over to leaders. Um, we have a lot of leaders on the line here. What can managers do to support their employees in the area of wellness? And I know, Rachel, you had talked a little bit about it earlier. So let me actually start with Dr. Aaliyah. All right. This is a, a, this is a fantastic question. The thing that comes to mind for me is boundaries. Uh, so this is, you know, everyone has boundaries that they'd love to set, especially when it comes to the work. And 
when you're talking to your manager, sometimes it can be very difficult to express yourself and say, hey, you know, I really have this boundary. I need to be able to go to my son's soccer tournament on this date at this time. I know it coincides with this particular meeting that we have. Is there any way that we can uh, work around this so that I can go to the soccer tournament? It's actually hard for people to say that, even though something may be really important in their lives. And so uh, when this was actually studied about 45% of people have something called boundary incongruence. They have, they know what their boundaries are. They know what they would like to sort of ask for and um, educate others around them about, but they either are unable to uh, share what those boundaries are, or those boundaries are not being held um, or upheld. And so there's there's two sides to, to that coin right there. So just checking in um, with folks that report to you that are on your team, uh, especially to your direct reports and saying, you know, what are the things that are important to you? What can I help support you on? Are there any boundaries that you may have that perhaps the team isn't aware of? Um, and really getting to know what's important to, to that person uh, allows them the space to share something that perhaps you never in a million years would have guessed. Perhaps they don't care about, uh, you know, uh, you know, something that you may think that they care about, and instead they care about something that you had absolutely no idea that would be such a big deal to them. So really having that open communication around boundaries so that, uh, you know, you as a manager can support the folks that work uh, with you, I think is one of the biggest ways to support. The second is really to take a, ge a genuine curiosity um, into the person. These people that work with us are not just our colleagues. They are multi-dimensional, dynamic, incredible, amazing humans that you have an opportunity to connect with. And I think when you think of it that way, you are a lot more curious about other people and that opens things up quite a bit. It opens up your perspective. It opens up how you want to work with them. It also op opens up how they feel about working with you. So just two of the things that are top of mind when you mention what leaders can do. Boundaries and curiosity. I feel like I'm I'm listing some tips with regards to leadership expectations at Cisco. We have seek to improve and team for results here, and there's a lot in there relative to and even opening ourselves up for feedback and being proximate to our employees as well as leaders. So um, really great, really great. Uh, Dr. Allen, anything to add with regards to tips and tricks relative to how managers can help support their employees? Great question. When we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and emotional well-being, being, leaders are actually like the first responders for both of these areas. When we have leaders that are trained in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and emotional well-being, they're educated, they're empowered, they're aware of this intersection. They're the ones that can really step up and provide the needed support to their employees from diverse backgrounds um, and any employee. And so managers are actually in the best position to handle sensitive issues and to have an awareness of how employees are experiencing the environment that they are in. And they're able to provide the support necessary to make changes, retransform the culture that these employees are in. And so when we talk about diversity and inclusion, one of the things I always want leaders to be mindful of is diversity simply is about representation, right? Diversity is about looking out into your team and identifying individuals that look, love, live, and worship differently. But when it comes to true, um, creating a true organization that thrives, it's the inclusion that is really vital. And that's where leaders have the biggest impact. Inclusion is creating the culture that supports that diversity. Inclusion is creating the safety that allows for that diversity to not only to survive, but also thrive. And so when we talk about what can leaders do, it's about looking at the actual culture that they manage and identifying how inclusive is it? How well do their employees feel like they belong, that they can tr truly show up in their authentic, as their authentic selves? And so what we encourage leaders to do is, again, lift our heads up, truly be intentional about creating proximity with our employees, start having conversations to understand those experiences, and create safety um, in creating and transforming change. Keep the diversity and inclusion coming, Dr. Allen. I love those. Those are such powerful uh, words and, and learnings for all of us. So thank you. Rachel, anything to add on this topic around managers? Sure. Um, 
I think it's, you know, have a think about what's in place in terms of well-being support uh, within your um, organisations, in your departments or divisions. Um, are they up to date with the changing world of, of work and what's actually going on in the world? Um, you look at how the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine has affected the global economy, the cost of living crisis, skyrocketing rocketing prices of fuel and food, interest rates, inflation. So it's all affecting us, but how is it affecting your, your teams? How are they coping? Um, and then always check in with your team members, you know, ask them how they really are um, and what needs to happen to make them feel better. And what resources are there available within the organisation? Are there peer groups that uh, people um, can join um, or do they need to be set up? Um, and then I always think leaders should walk their talk. Um, so I think well-being comes from the top. And I think that for leaders to show their authentic selves and be vulnerable is, is a good thing because it shows that they, they care. There is an empathy there. And, you know, finally, it's, rem it's remembering that your employees, if they're happy and healthy, um, obviously, you're going to have a happy, healthy company as well and happy, healthy profits. They are the backbone of your organization. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. We have time for one more question. I'm going to come to you, Dr. Allen, on this one. We have not only Cisco employees in the audience today, but we have customers and partners as well. Any best practices or calls to action that you can share for our customers of Cisco and our partners of Cisco? Oh, I love that question. Um, when we think about best practices, one of the things I always like to drill down to is the simplest thing that each and every one of us can do is approach each and every one of us through the lens of true humanity. That's really it. Um, when we think about how do we engage with one another, again, we do it through grace and mercy. We do it through curiosity. We do it by assuming positive intentions. Um, when we think about how to truly drive change, one of the things that each and every one of us, especially all of the women that are listening to this call on the Women of Impact, is remember that even though we're women, we're all walking through the world experiencing it very differently. Drill down beyond just our gender and look at the intersectionalities that each and every one of us are walking through the world with and get to know one another beyond just the gender and really cultivate authentic relationships across those differences. And so keep those close connections while learning and growing together. Thank you. Dr. Alia Yaku, anything to add relative to any tips for our customers and partners of Cisco? Yeah, absolutely. I would say put your own oxygen mask on first. Uh, know that, you know, I have to say self-care, self-care, self-care. Be in touch with yourself, be aware of your needs. If you're not taking care of yourself, you cannot pour from an empty cup. And so, uh, you know, at some point, the gas, uh, the, the car without gas uh, doesn't drive, um, is what I like to say. So you have to refuel yourself, your mind, body, your spirit, whatever that looks like for you, and uh, keep yourself going that way. So that's the first one. And then the other is kind of uh, very similar to what Dr. Allen was saying. At Thrive, we talk about micro steps. If you want to change your behavior, if you want to show up better every day, you have to uh, take into account small habit changes, really small tweaks that you can make that are too small to fail. Um, trying to uh, bite off more than you can chew can be really discouraging, but those really small little wins and celebrating them every day, that's how we start noticing that incremental change um, and showing up better every day. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so I'm going to close this out. This has been wonderful. And again, I feel truly honored to be here for the Women of Impact event. Uh, at Cisco, we're constantly learning and constantly evolving ourselves. And as the global head of benefits, I also have an ask of you, and that is to please take time to visit your country benefit sites and learn about the great benefits and resources that Cisco offers. And we also have a global well-being SharePoint site that we have many resources, including a, a new topic on resilience. And I had talked about the hashtag safe to talk site as well that you could access there. But we have many resources and please leverage our resources. 
I want to thank our expert panelists today, and I want to give a huge shout out to all of those that put on this session. I know they worked long hours and they got us all organized, and I just really appreciate it. And thank you for attending this event. It's been a wonderful afternoon to listen and learn, and I hope you and, and wish you all the best on the rest of your Women of Impact event. Thank you for joining us. If we're to build a bridge to an inclusive future, then getting healthcare to everyone, everywhere is critical. Take rural Europe, where local doctors leaving for big cities is creating a medical desert. For patients left behind, many lack the mobility or the flexibility to reach critical urban appointments. The remedy, it turns out, is as much a technological marvel as it is a medical one. Meet Medibus, a state-of-the-art clinic on four wheels. But designing such a wonder came with its own set of challenges, taking everything Cisco knows about mobility, connectivity, video conferencing, and security into account. And together with partner Deutsche Bahn, dispatching it from the cloud to create a 21st century lifeline. Now, no area is too remote. No diagnosis or specialist unavailable. All because one company dared to wonder if the road to better healthcare could literally be the road that runs through town. That's the inclusive future. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Where will you be in five years? Where will we be in five years? In 25, in 50? Let's be here and here with her and him and they. Let's connect them. Let's connect everyone. Let's deliver technology that gives them access to power opportunity. Let's set a new standard for data security and personal privacy. Let's change the system. Promote equality and fairness in the workplace. Let's tear down the barriers to social justice for a more inclusive world. Let's clean house, zero carbon, zero waste because the health of our family is tied to the future of our home. Let's gather resources and partners, steer toward our greatest challenges and accelerate. For the benefit, for all. Cisco has made it its purpose to power an inclusive future for all. Where will we be in 50 years? Let's go see. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Yellow is the color of the sun. It's light, it's warmth. Yellow is a light bulb, illumination, inspiration. Yellow is my promise to even the odds for kids through education. Yellow Hab is about the students embracing and engaging the yellow lens of possibility. We are reimagining education, and to do that, we need like-minded partners. Cisco is driven by innovation and imagination, but our purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. Cisco shares Yellow Hab's vision of inclusivity, and we are so happy to announce our partnership to provide state-of-the-art networking, collaboration, and security tools for Yellow Hab and its students. Partnering with companies like Cisco that really believe in what we're doing is what we're all about. And we're just getting started, so let's make it happen. humans and nature we're in this together yet nature has given and given it's our turn to do more cisco smart building solutions and our partners technology benefit both humans and nature catalyst switches connect securely delivering power over ethernet reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. 
Cisco Wireless and DNA Spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet. And collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hybrid work is here. It's there. It's everywhere. But for someone to be able to work from here, or here, there has to be someone here, making sure everything is safe, secure, consistent. So go ahead, log in from here, dial in from here, sit in from here, assured that someone is here with a view of everywhere, ready to fix anything, anytime, anywhere, even here. That's because nobody, and I mean nobody, makes hybrid work work better. Cisco, the bridge to possible. I immigrated to this country in 1975, and I didn't even know the alphabet. So I didn't speak any English. I stuck out like a sore thumb. Mary and I first met in sixth grade in Vienna, Virginia in 1975. She joined our sixth grade class at Marshall Road Elementary School, and I was asked to help Mary learn English. The teacher sent us to a private room. They gave us three Sears catalogs. We got a notebook, we got some scissors and some paste, and cut out pictures, paste them in a notebook, spell out the item, and that's how I learned English. Mary showed me how to be brave. I'm very, very grateful because it made me who I am today. I am a Cisco account manager. I love what I do because sales is all about grit and problem solving. I had a client that had an issue. I contacted a coworker uh, about the issue. Once the issue was resolved, I started receiving IMs from that coworker saying, Did you go to elementary school in Vienna? Yes. Marshall Road. Moved to the U.S. in the sixth grade? Yes, I didn't know how to speak English. Oh my gosh, Judy? Yep, it was actually Mary. It was the girl from Marshall Road Elementary School that I taught English to. Judy, how long has it been? My gosh, I finally get to see you. 40 something years. <laughs> Oh, it's great to see, Good you. to see you. I think one of the things that makes this special and reconnecting with you is special is um, really seeing how willing you were to learn, how eager you were to learn. And look at you now, the top 1% of the Cisco Salesforce, Cisco Hall of Fame. And that desire for learning and improvement really resonates with me because it represents a, a way in which we can be most successful for our customers and help them the most. Then use some of those same practices and behaviors that we learned yeah. as schoolmates together. And now we're know? teammates again, collaborating again, working together to solve yeah. problems for the customer. Absolutely. I think that's like, you know, we, we brought this whole thing full circle. Happy International Women's Day, everyone, and welcome to our 2023 Women of Impact Give Back Session. I'm your host, Chanel Davis, and along with my wonderful co-host, Marie Webb and Dina Spivey, we serve as your Women of Cisco America's 
partnership and give back co-leads. We are going to keep the celebration going this morning with a special presentation featuring our 2023 Women of Impact America's Give Back Partner, Dress for Success. But before we begin, let's take a quick moment to introduce our esteemed panel. First, we have Elaine Mason, Senior Vice President with Purpose, Strategy, and Innovation. Danilo Pozo, Vice President of Customer Experience and our LATAM Theater Sponsor. Next, we have Megan Risley, Program Director with the Dress for Success Triangle. Then we have Tracy Pastor, Project Manager and Dress for Success Triangle Success Story. We have Ken St. Hill, Business Analyst, RTP Emerging Talent, and Dress for Success Volunteer. And last but not least, we have Lee Hickman, who is a Sales Operations Strategy Analyst with Dress for Success Volunteer as well. So for our first question, we'll hand it off to Elaine and then Danilo. So Elaine, how does powering one's purpose align with Dress for Success mission of empowering women to achieve economic independence? So first, Chanel, uh, happy uh, women's happy women's month, history month. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, and Dress for Success has a direct connection to purpose, mostly because purpose has a direct connection to our careers. So let me break down your question into two parts. Uh, first, Dress for Success, as we know, enables women to prepare for everything from applying to a job acqu to acquiring a job and hopefully starting someone on a really meaningful career path. So it connects the purpose in this way. Our purpose represents our reason for being or basically what we wanna be known for and what we value. And you can see that at Cisco when you look at Cisco's purpose, powering an inclusive future for all. What are we known for? Well, if we're not known for anything, we are certainly known for closing the digital divide. It's our purpose at this company. And then ultimately, when we talk about inclusive for all, it's what we value that we wanna make sure that our purpose is doing what we do best, connecting the world and doing it for everyone. So when you think about your personal purpose, you're clear on what you're positioned for, you'll know where you wanna go, you can share your best self when you're looking for a job or a career, and you can find a company where you feel connected. So essentially, purpose serves as an amplifier for what Dress for Success offers to women in guiding and driving their careers. Thank you so much, Elaine. That was very impactful. And next, we'll head over to Danilo. Danilo, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about your perspective? Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you so much for just giving us the opportunity to be here. I think this is a wonderful panel and a great opportunity to just send out our message, right? And, and when you talk about purpose, I think that when we look at Latin America and other countries and all our countries, is this serves such a bigger purpose. Of, of just, you know, how do we elevate women to leadership positions and inclusions? It's just, how do we change society as a all, right? It's it's just incredible what uh, Dress for Success can do. And, and building trust, you know, when you talk about trust, you talk, you, you talk about, you know, how these future leaders are feeling, how they're building confidence, how we're willing to take risk, how exactly can they come across in the corporate world and, and going back to elevate our society. We in Latin America, we have a rich history, right? We, we There's some ups and some downs. And we really believe that if we actually, you know, elevate this, uh, our women to become the future leaders, we're elevating actually society. It's just not only about the workplace. And that's a given. We are very excited, right? We're very excited to have them have that opportunity. But we also think we can do a greater good and the purpose, as Elaine mentioned. Um, we also we're very proud of you know and how are we our generosity we're not really expecting anything back what we're really doing is what can we give so women can elevate in our societies all over the world and have you know that that bigger purpose that we're looking for uh, i think in dress for success for a lot of time it's just very important right we we actually in two and two or three countries in latin america but we're trying to replicate that all over the place uh, we we think that we can do a great service to to us in cisco and to every all the, all the companies to make sure that we work with with future leaders, with future women, we build their confidence, we build practices, we have that discussion, and it's to look and to see how is everybody else doing it. Is somebody like 
people on this panel can do that. We want to make sure that all these future leaders, women also have the opportunity to say, I can also do it as well. And that's a chapter that we're really excited about. So again, thank you for that. We think that collectively can do can do that. If we five people get together to make sure that we collectively have this purpose, that's great. If we can get 10 people, 100 people doing it, that's just a wonderful thing so we can build that community of giving back. That's excellent. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you, Danilo. And as someone who regularly uses their time to give, I'm so proud to work for a company and leaders like yourself that supports that mission. So thank you for that. And that's a great segue to our next panelist, because who can better attest to the positive impact that Dress for Success has had in their life than one of our own? So we have Tracy here, who's a former client and current success story and success Sisconian, excuse me, uh, would you be able to just share a little bit about your story with us and your personal journey? Chanel, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I would love to share my story with all of you guys. Um, I was one of those people that you hear about that is rare nowadays, of those who work for one company their whole life and retires from there. Um, basically, I started out at the ground level and I progressively moved up and around. I never had a resume. But I never had to interview for a position because my work spoke for itself. Over the years um, with this company, I went through two major acquisitions and some significant reorganizations, but I always made the cut. The last one brought me here to North Carolina and uh, where I do not have any family or any network, but I was really glad to still be employed with the company. And after about two years of being here, there was another reorganization where I was not so lucky. So <laughs> there you go. Um, I got comfortable with where I was at with the company that I was with, and I had worked there my whole career. Now I found myself in a place that I wasn't prepared to be. I was living in an area where I didn't know anyone, and I hadn't had to interview or use a resume since 1998. I never had a LinkedIn page because I wasn't looking for a job. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a waste of my time. Well, I was <laughs> sadly mistaken there. Um, so at this time, I decided to take some career classes at Wake Tech, and a professor told me that she thought that it, I should apply for the Dress for Success program. I had never heard about it, but I was really ready to find out. So I did some digging, and I applied for the Dress for Success program, and I found out the job market had changed considerably since I was last in it. The Dress for Success program taught me about the ATS system and how to use keywords to line up my application to the job, how to have a focus in intentional job search. Don't just apply everywhere. Make sure that you are focused on what you want to do. Resume writing. They have a staff of reviewers and volunteers, and they make your resume the best that it can be. I, as a matter of fact, I didn't even recognize myself after going through the resume sessions um, because I was using the old way of, of, of doing my resume. So um, they helped to um, get my achievements in there and make it look excellent. LinkedIn, they navigated me through what I needed to do on my professional profile and I got that up and running. And uh, a major part of the program is support. The other ladies who are going through the same thing, you know, they we all shared, you know, the same journey. Um, from all different kind of walks of life. Some are professional, some are not, but we were all in the same position. They provide different classes and webinars, um, anywhere from self-esteem, leadership skills, and a host of other topics. But that gets us to the interviewing. And the interviewing, um, they, they provide mock interviews um, with a, a ver various companies throughout the triangle, which is really nice because you get a different taste of different people. And what it is, is it helps build confidence and gain relevant feedback to improve our interviewing skills in a non-threatening environment. This is one of the things that was really valuable to me because I had been out of the field for so long. Um, I was able to interview with some great companies and then <laughs> the strangest thing occurred. Um, when it was posted uh, that Cisco was one of the companies that was doing mock interviews, I definitely um, went ahead and put my name on the list because I had just applied to Cisco probably about, you know, a few weeks before, and I had just completed my second interview. 
and they were going to schedule my third. So I was uh, paired up uh, with someone who was um, who had just actually been hired about four months beforehand. And so I <laughs> I was talking to her, and like I said, it was a divine intervention because she had just been hired and she was excited to provide me all of the information that she had gone through and she wanted to prep me. And even after the mock interview session, we met several times to do some more prep and she allayed all my fears. With her encouragement, advice and support, I felt very comfortable in my final interview. And <laughs> I was eventually offered a job at Cisco where I am here today. Um, so yes, you don't know if you're gonna stay with your company or not, but uh, this Dress for Success definitely helped me prepare myself to get to the next step. And um, now I just recently hosted two mock interviews with Cisco with Dress for Success just last week. And I get an opportunity to give back to the program that helped me when I needed it the most. I know how much it means to the ladies and I can advocate for them because I, was, I, I used to be one of them. In my role as philanthropy lead, I will continue to host mock interviews, participate in clothing drives or whatever dress for success needs in order to help the ladies succeed. Giving back is very important to me. You never know who you're going to impact and in what way. It takes so little time and is very rewarding for all parties. Thank you, Chanel. Oh, thank you, Tracy. Talk about a full circle moment you are the true definition of a success story, and we are so thankful for you. Um, and with that, we have our program director with the local chapter of Dress for Success Triangle that Tracy has partnered with. So Megan, with that, would you tell us a little bit more about Dress for Success Triangle? Sure, happy to. And I'm not sure how much more I can tell. Tracy does such a fantastic job telling our story. Uh, here in the Triangle, Dress for Success works to economically empower women by providing a network of support, development tools, and clothing, but more importantly, working together with partners like Cisco, we leverage the one-on-one -on -one connections that are made to make an impact and help women deepen their professional relationships to grow their networks and to develop, and to develop their careers. Women come to us for what they need and we meet them with various programs like our Career Pathways program that help women transition from one industry to another with our skill-based webinars and with our job acquisition networking groups and partnerships with community colleges and services that are delivered virtually, hybridly, and in person through our three brick and mortar locations and also now via our mobile boutique. Um, and like Danilo was saying earlier, elevating women to share another story of how we do that. Um, for one woman a few years ago, just like Tracy, she the Going Places Network and our one-on-one -on -one career coaching was what she needed to secure a position with a large local company. So she got a job there and started working, but now she came back to Dress for Success to leverage our Google IT Career Certificate Program to help her develop her career at that company, and she has her sights on a VP position. For Cisco here in the Triangle, it's meant making an impact on our clients by providing feedback on their interview skills and their resumes. And ultimately, what we have learned now in our 15 years of being here in the Triangle is that it's the one-on-one -on -one relationships and connections that makes the most difference in the women that we see and that come to Dress for Success Triangle. That is incredible. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Have we partnered together over the years to produce 160 sessions of mock interviews between Cisco and Dress for Success Triangle? That's right. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's incredible. Thank you, yes. Megan. We are so blessed to have you, your team at Dress for Success. 
and wonderful people like Tracy, but it takes also internal champions at Cisco to tie it all together. So we have two of our goodwill ambassadors, Ken and Lee, to talk a little bit more about their personal journey and their story in partnership with Dress for Success. So Ken, could you tell us a little bit more about our partnership and some of the things that you've done? Thanks, Chanel. Uh, I'd love to. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Tracy and Megan. Um, it was an absolute pleasure working with the both of you. I think when we initially started um, brainstorming with the Emerging Talent Team, uh, some of the other philanthropy leaders, um, Angelica Hood and, and Zach Pitts and Tracy, I had no idea what Dress Success did. I thought they assumed that they only collected clothing for professional attire for women. And as you heard from some of the other panelists, there's a host of other services that they provide. Everything from employment retention to job training. And once I heard Tracy's success story, it was clear that this was the, the it was a no brainer that this was the program that we wanted to partner with to do our mock um, interviews. And when Megan sent over some of that collateral and we had our, our first few meetings, I kept hearing a reoccurring theme and the theme surrounded kindness and empathy. And it was easy to see that they were being empathetic toward these women um, with the way that they structured these interviews and the feedback they were giving. So that allowed me to craft some of my feedback in a way that was both constructive, but also catered to the needs of those women. And I was really happy to do that. And it made me feel good and it was helpful to them as well. During those two days of those mock sessions, we had some Q&A at the end. And during that Q&A, um, we were continuing to get feedback, but we also noticed that a lot of the participants were just really thankful um, for us taking the time to help them um, and giving them some encouraging words to help them going forward. And after that, I, I'm convinced I'm going to be working with uh, DFS in the future every year, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the rest of the philanthropy group with the RTP Emerging Talent. You all are incredible. Um, I tried to join the Mark interviews. I had a conflict, but I was pinging Angelica Hood in the background. You two coordinated a wonderful event, and we have some pictures to share with you of our clients and our Ciscoanians. So we thank you so much for that. And as a part of that partnership, we also have Lee. She's done incredible work, again, with the local chapter of Dress for Success Triangle. And so Lee, could you tell us a little bit more about your professional development experience with Dress for Success? Sure, thank you, Chanel. So hello, everyone. My name is Lee Hickman, and I am thrilled to speak to you today about my experience with Dress for Success. So 15 months ago, I transitioned from human resources to CX, and prior to that, I spent over a decade in Cisco talent acquisition, seven of which was on the university relations team, now known as ETR, early talent recruiting. So in my time as a university manager, we created several professional development seminars and presented them to college students all across the United States. We coached hundreds through mock interviews, resume reviews, and guidance on creating their personal brand, both in person and online. We help these students prepare to enter the corporate world as interns, co-ops, and new grads, and these programs 100% help attract and identify top talent for Cisco. So through the women of Cisco, I was so excited to find the opportunity to provide the same kind of professional development coaching through the Dress for Success program, because I know firsthand how meaningful and impactful this training can be I knew I had to be a part of it. So we were partnered with our mentees, provided with their resume and a list of sample interview questions. And then we were encouraged to make our time with them as positive and meaningful as possible. So on the day of the event, everyone gathered for an overview of the program and then we split out into our groups. And that is when I met Michelle. Michelle is a talented, driven, and self-motivated woman who is seeking a major career change from public education to IT. And I can relate to the shift. I had used my experience going from HR to CX to encourage her and keep her motivated in her journey to own her future. She clearly demonstrated a passion for technology and helping people. She's obtained several technical certifications and is currently doing entry-level IT work for Duke University Hospital. We had an excellent mock interview, 
and we reviewed her resume and we even got to set up some additional time afterwards to make sure that she had all of the constructive feedback that she could need to go from good to great. So I would encourage each of you here today to volunteer for Dress for Success. At Cisco, we have all gone through corporate interviews. We've been on dynamic teams and we no doubt have a collection of best practices that can and should be shared to benefit others. So what tips have someone given to you to help you land that next role? What were some interview questions that you wish you had prepared for? And what are some resume must haves that are crucial in getting you just through the door? So use your experience and your desire to give back and impact the life of someone else who one day may be your next teammate. Thank you. Excellent. I am just, I'm blown away. I am speaking for our audience when I say that countless women will benefit from your knowledge share, from our compassionate support, and our just collective empathy and support and encouragement. Yeah. We partner with charities and charitable organizations all of the time. But I think what really stands out about this give back partnership with Dress for Success is that we can see real time changes and real time impact, not only in the lives of the Dress for Success clients, but also in the hearts and minds of our Ciscoians. So thank you so much to all of our panelists. And as we close with my co-host Marie, we just again want to thank you for your time today and just leave you with a few things to consider over the next several weeks. Thank you, Marie. Wow, thank you everyone that's been participating today. I just think of the sponsorship and leadership that we have from Danilo and Elaine. Thank you for empowering women and making your purpose, the ability to lift others up and really expand that throughout our organization here at Cisco. And Tracy, I'm just touched by your story. And I love that you're already giving back. And Megan, thank you for what you're doing day in and day out. We get, we get to participate in these activities, but you live it day in and day out. And thank you for that. And Ken and Lee, it's been so fun getting to know you and seeing your passion for getting others excited about give back. So thank you and keep it going. And now it's your turn. So you've seen what Triangle DFS is doing. We want all of Cisco, women of Cisco, making an impact by donating through Dress for Success. You've heard of a couple of ways you can do it. You can do it monetarily. We've got the uh, QR code here for you. You can donate your time. And Cisco matches your time. We, we are so blessed. Cisco encourages us to give our finances and matches that. They also match our time. They match our heart. So let's make sure that uh, the rest of Cisco is doing what we're doing at Triangle DFS and donating to your local chapters for DFS. Uh, volunteer at your local affiliates. And let's make an impact. Let's make it our purpose to empower others and make an impact. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marie Webb, and I'm the Operations Director for Collaboration Sales and U.S. Commercial. This is my seventh Women of Impact event, and I'm super excited that this year I actually get to be part of it as part of the Give Back and Partnership Committee with Dina and Chanel. Dina and Chanel are amazing women. I love working with them. I love their heart for giving back whether it's giving back within the, within the Cisco community through Women of Cisco or I've seen a lot of the work they're doing outside of Cisco as well. And quite honestly, I don't know how they do it, but I'm just super honored to partner with them. And it's a blessing. As you saw, Chanel just host this session. She is a work of art and just super excited to work with her. And Dina is a fireball in terms of, she's been on so many committees, I, I can learn a lot. So just really appreciate them. I love most about this event is that we have an opportunity to give back. I've said it before, but Cisco is unique. They encourage us to give back in so many ways. And Women of Impact is an investment in you and you can invest in others. So that's a little bit about my story. What about you, Chanel? I love that. And I love you, Marie. You light up every room that you're in. 
And one of the best parts about being a part of this give back and partnership team is being able to follow your leadership. And I love the fact that Dina is here. She adds a special je ne sais quoi to every room that she's in. And I love the fact that she's in my hometown of Washington, DC. So we have a lot of fun together and we're fighting the good fight. And so I just wanna leave everyone with a call to action to get involved in your local chapter. We're all dealing with so much in our personal lives in this hybrid work environment. And one of the best ways to manage your stress and your time and give back to your community is to get involved. So I love being here and I love working with all of you. Oh, Chanel Marie, this is this is why we want to do what we do. Um, I haven't been at Cisco long and definitely starting with COVID was a challenge. And so for me, I wanted to find a way that I can give back because I know it really um, feeds my soul to be able to work with some inspiring women and to have a place that um, knowing we all try to get to impact. So some of the things for me is why women of impact matters. We get to share these experiences, some of the challenges, some of the triumphs. Um, and we share these stories so we can bridge those gaps between everyone across all different places around the world. And then for also to inspire everyone to reach new heights and be able to say, how can I help um, my fellow employee or some of those others who need something else from us? And I know that's what Dress for Success really focused on, um, but I know I'm getting so much by being able to work with folks like Marie and Chanel, but also want to inspire those of you all. Um, take the time, figure out where best you can make a difference and do it. So cheers, ladies. Salud. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you Salud. for the opportunity to make a difference. Mohammed, and I'm a product manager with Cisco Learning and Certifications team. This year, I'm also part of the Women of Cisco America's board as retention co-lead. Two events that the retention pillar brings to you are Women of Impact, and she speaks to inspire your career journeys at Cisco. This is my fifth Cisco Women of Impact event since joining the company, and my first as part of the organizing and planning team. I'm really excited about all the sessions that we put together with great care, diligence, and intention. I hope you enjoy all of them as much as we enjoyed creating them. I would like to thank all the volunteers, speakers, and sponsors for their help and support because without them, this event wouldn't be possible. Happy 10th Annual Women of Impact. Hi, my name is Carla Rivera, and I am the co-lead for Women of Cisco America's board. I am so excited to attempt my ninth time at Women of Impact. And this is the 10th annual celebration of Women of Impact and I'm so excited to be a part of it. My very favorite part of Women of Cisco and Women of Impact is the diverse spectrum across this employee resource group. It is incredible that there is such intersectionality and diversity across the spectrum. And we have the opportunity to lift other women up, lift up intentional allies, um, encourage others, and of course, women supporting women and continue to evolve and embed this value of women supporting women across Cisco. So excited about this um, event this year. It is going to be an incredible one of celebration, of having real authentic conversations and some that are very difficult, that touches on very difficult subjects, 
but offers amazing and pragmatic solutions. So I am so excited for this year. I want to thank all of the amazing leaders and committee from Global to Americas that have made this possible. Thank you so much and cheers. Hi, my name is Chanel Davis and I am a sales acceleration manager with the Global Strategic Partner Managed as a Service team here at Cisco. And this is my third Women of Impact event and probably the best one yet. What I'm looking most forward to about this 10th anniversary of Women of Impact is what I've always loved about it in the past. It gives us a good fun reason to slow down, a good cause for pause and get to know some of our colleagues and have some fun in the process. Cause let's be honest, the last three years have been rough and especially on women. We not only are expected to show up each and every day at work and support our projects and our colleagues, we're doing our fair share at home as well, even with the best of partners. And so why not during Women's History Month, take a moment and give yourself permission to relax, have fun, network, laugh, share stories, and get to know the other women and our allies at our company and just celebrate you. And so I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate all the work that you do. I appreciate all the work that goes unrecognized and unseen. And I see you and we value you, not only here at Cisco, but also in our community. So cheers to you and cheers to the 10th annual Women of Impact event. Go have some fun, ladies. You deserve it. Hi, my name is Mona Hudak and I'm a business development manager on the CX Demand Gen team. This is my second Women of Impact event and what I love the most was being part of the Women of Impact leadership team that launched this year's event. The collaboration and the partnerships are great and along with all of the hard work, we strive to recognize the intentions when we are all powered by purpose. We celebrate all of our inclusive communities and our allies as we each own our wellness, our career, and our future. Cheers to the 10th annual Women of Impact event. Hello everyone, my name is Jose van Dijk and I'm excited that we're gathering once again for Cisco's Women of Impact event. There's been many events already in the past, but it is always great to participate in this event. And why? Because even though we celebrate women every day, it is great to get together as a community and share our successes, understand and conquer the challenges that we have, but also how we gain momentum by celebrating our impact with our colleagues and sharing our life's momentum milestones with friends and family. So I do hope that you will enjoy Cisco's Women of Impact and I look forward to seeing many of you. So cheers and have a fantastic day. Hi everyone. My name is Gabby. I am one of the project managers for Women of Cisco Amherst Board. And this year, in fact, I was given the opportunity to be the project manager for Women of Impact. Very happy and very pleased to have worked together with the planning and strategy team, putting together sessions, thinking of every single one of you with very real topics, conversations that sometimes for some reason, they're not brought up or not being talked about. So looking forward to March the 8th, very pleased again to have worked together with so many great women to make sure that you'll enjoy this time with us. Cheers to the 10th annual Women of Impact event. Hi there, my name is Mahalia Vandenberg. I lead customer enablement over at WebEx Events, and this is my first Cisco Women of Impact. As an Aqua hired employee or an employee that came to Cisco through an acquisition, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to network and learn more about all the amazing resources that Cisco has to offer. As a Women of Cisco board member, Watching everyone come together to put on this incredible event is so energizing and tells me I've landed at the right place, where everyone works together to make magic happen. 
Cheers to our 10th annual Women of Impact event. Hi, I'm Mika Vilayat, and I'm an engineering program manager for Cisco WebEx and co-lead on Cisco Women's Board for America's region. This is my 10th Women of Impact event. Um, what I like most about this event is getting together with women, sharing our challenges and experiences, learning from each other, and celebrating each other. This year, I'm most excited about um, learning from our great speakers all about allyship and the power of purpose. So cheers to 10 Cisco Women of Impact. Hi, my name is Jen Veloff. I'm a project manager in GSSO, as well as the co-lead for the track pillar of Women of Cisco Americas. This is my second Women of Impact, and I'm so very excited to learn and expand my knowledge during this wonderful event. Cheers, Women of Impact, on your 10th anniversary. Thank you for providing such an inspirational, thoughtful experience for so many. Hi, my name is Tracy Wright, Principal Corporate Counsel at Cisco and also co-president of Women of Cisco Carolinas. This is my third Women of Impact event and I am so excited. My favorite part of Women of Impact is the collaboration between all of these dynamic women at Cisco and all of our speakers and panelists who always leave us inspired. I hope to see you there. Hey everybody, it's Hope Galley, global channel leader and SP leader for Cisco Meraki. I just wanted to take a moment to say how excited I am to be here at the 10th Women's of Impact event. Through the years, I've made friends with so many people from this event. I've met mentors, mentees. I've got new workout partners from here. And um, I've also uh, brought people into my organization as a result of meeting with the Women of Impact. I love the energy. I love the opportunity that we get to share what's going on at home as well as in work. And also just be in a safe environment to um, really leverage the strengths of everyone out there. So I'm looking forward to this event, attending it in person in Chicago, as well as across the pond. And I just want to say to everyone out there, have an amazing Women of Impact event. And uh, I got my disco ball ready. And I just want to say cheers to everyone out there. Take care, everybody. Hi there. My name is Elaine Goodman, and I'm Chairman Emeritus of Women of Cisco Americas. I'm really excited to be at my seventh Women of Impact. One of my favorite things is the fact that we get to network and spend time with each other. But in addition to that, I love the fact that this is a 100% volunteer driven event. So a big thank you to all you volunteers who have made this day a really great one for us. So while we're at it, cheers to the 10th Annual Women of Impact. Hi, I'm Amy Dawson and I am the Sales Enablement Content and Strategy Lead in the Partner Managed and As a Service organization in the Global Partner Route to Market Sales Org. This is my second Cisco Women of Impact event, and I'm super excited because I love all of the speakers. I love all of the women coming together for this amazing event. Have a great, great event. Congratulations, Cisco. Cheers to our 10th annual Women of Impact event. Hi, my name is Imari Wei, and I am a Provider Elevate Specialist within the GPRS organization. And this is my very first Women of Impact. And I am so thrilled to witness women supporting other women. Cheers to 10 phenomenal years. Hi, my name is Lauren Armpriester, and this is my fourth Cisco Women of Impact. My favorite thing about Women of Impact is meeting other women, being inspired by them, and giving back. Cheers to this year's 10th Annual Women of Impact. Hey, hello. My name is Monica Costa. I'm on the co-lead for Women of Cisco chapter in LATAM. I'm from Mexico City, and I have been in the company for around 10 years right now, and this is my eighth event for Women of Impact. And uh, what do I love about most this event? This year, we're going to drive around purpose and we're going to have outstanding speakers a session to talk about wellness, to talk about uh, eldership. So please, please uh, join the event. And uh, let's cheers about this 10 year women of being back to event. Hi, my name is Miriam Leon and I'm a technical agile coach within the CX America's service provider organization. This is my eighth year participating in the Woman of Impact event, 
And what I really love about this event is that it gives us the opportunity to get inspired, to learn, reflect, and connect with each other. I'm looking forward this year to really learning about how to power my purpose and bring an inclusive future for all women. So in light of this, I want to celebrate to 10 years of successful Women of Impact. Cheers. Hi guys, this is Carmen Brios and I am part of the Dawson and Ice team in the Custom Engineering Organization. And this would be my seventh time attending the Cisco Women of Impact event. What I love the most about this day is a part of the speakers. You know, after a full day of conferences, I just feel like super empowered, powerful, and ready to do everything, to level up my career, to challenge my fears, to do everything. So I'm really looking forward to sharing the key takeaways with my woman colleagues this time after two years of doing it remotely. With that being said, cheers to our 10th annual of Women of Impact event. Hello, my name is Andrea Witzke. I'm a managed services sales specialist, and this is my sixth Women of Impact event. And I'm very much looking forward to hear inspirational stories of successful women in business slash in the IT. And cheers to the 10th annual event of Women of Impact. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Dobbs and I'm Sales Acceleration Pam on our APO Managed Services team. And this is my fifth year participating in Cisco's Women of Impact event. What I love most is Women of Impact provides a safe, professional, and fun community of women supporting women covering topics from mental health, professional growth, to volunteering. Cheers to our 10th annual Women of Impact event. Hi everyone, my name is Mesa Anshasi. I'm a business development manager within GPRS and this will be my number four Cisco Women of Impact event that I'm very excited and looking forward to. One of my favorite things about this event is the fact that thousands of women and men come together from across the globe seeking not only to connect, but to develop personally and professionally and be inspired by, by others and their stories and their experiences. So cheers to another event. Hi, I'm Marcia Muniz, Senior Legal Director for Latin America, Canada, and CMT Americas. And a woman of Cisco Americas Advisor Board member. This is the ninth Women of Impact event that I attend. And I can tell you without a shadow of doubt that all of them were impactful. It helped me to strengthen my skills, to build new connections, to grow my career, and of course, it's a great opportunity to have fun with my colleagues. I believe that in this fast-paced world, sometimes we do not devote time to ourselves as we should. And Women of Impact is a call to action. I have never left an event without feeling re-energized, stronger, and more supporting than before. I am so glad that the upcoming event is around and I challenge myself to be at my best. Cheers to the 10th Annual Women of Impact event. Hello everybody, welcome to Women of Impact. Congratulations to the team for putting this event on for 10 years. You know, this event is on top of the day job for many people who are involved in it. So I just wanted to say that I'm so impressed with all the work that you've done to make this so well worth our time. Great speakers, great content, great breakout sessions, discussions, and new relationships formed. Thank you and congratulations on 10 years. I'm Brenda Dennis, Vice President for Cisco. And 25 years ago, I helped co-found the first Women's Action Network. And I'm so proud to see how far we've come as a company. I'm proud to see the amount of excitement and involvement and development that's happening across the company in this space. Now, today, the company has given us a true gift. Women of Impact is a true gift. And what do I mean by that? It's not only that you're getting great content and speakers in breakout sessions, but you're getting the company's okay to put work aside for a day to focus on you, to focus on your development, to focus on your needs, for you to make new relationships, new connections. We don't always get that gift. So thank you, Cisco, for that. Now, what I'd also like to say is that we have curveballs thrown at all the time in life. It could be something with your health, 
your family, a relationship. You could have a curveball thrown at you in your career when you least expect it. At the end of the day, this type of an event is a great opportunity for you to step back and regroup, to rethink about what's important to you, what it is that you want, how you will get there, learn about yourself, be very open and honest and transparent and real about those things that you could be doing better or differently. Use the time to not only help you, but help others. This is truly a gift. I'm excited for you to have this day today, but most importantly, I'm excited to see what you do with all this great new learning content and relationships after the end of the day today. That's what really matters. Do something with it. You all are amazing. Congratulations to the team again. Here's to 10 years of Women in Impact and 10 more. Have a great day, everyone. Hey everyone, my name is Isabella Yanni and I am the incoming Chief of Staff for our Chief Customer and Partner Officer, Jeff Sherrods. I'm so excited to spend today at Women of Impact. It's my 10th Women of Impact event and the thing I look forward to most every single year is the inspiration that we're going to take from today the stories, the best practices, the lessons learned from all of the amazing fellow Cisco employees as well as speakers that we've brought in. And I know that at the end of each day, I'm going to pick one big idea to go implement in my own business or in my career plan. So enjoy today and happy 10th annual Cisco Women of Impact. Cheers! Hi there, I'm Nicola Yeager, a business development manager in the Global Partner Organization. I lead on managed security service creation. And this is my daughter Ava, who has a real interest in becoming an IT security consultant. I'm gonna be soon attending my first ever Cisco Women of Impact event. I'm really looking forward to listening to all the stories from inspiring women across our Cisco organization, but more importantly, actually across our partner community. And I'd just like to say cheers to our 10th anniversary of Cisco Women of Impact event. Hi, my name is Michelle Raguse McBain, Provider Elevate Leader for the Global Partner Routes to Market Sales at Cisco. And I'm joined with my two daughters, Brooklyn and, and Kelly. Yes, and we are so excited to be celebrating Cisco's 10th anniversary for Women of Impact with Women's History Month. We're delighted to have our partners, customers, and employees join us on March 8th and 9th for our 10th annual Women of Impact event. In my 14 years at Cisco, I love how Cisco puts inclusion, equity, and diversity front and center for all of their employees and for everyone that we connect with. So in honor of you, Cisco, we would like to cheers with our mocktails. Cheers to Cisco. Cisco! Hello everyone, my name is Miriam Leon. Alongside my Women of Cisco Americas co-chair, Carla Rivera, we want to welcome you to the impact of the intentional allyship session. The purpose of this session is to dive deep into intentional allyship. The session consists of two parts. In the first half of the session, a DNI expert will talk with our COO about her perspective on allyship. And then in the second half, we will continue the conversation with our esteemed panel, consisting of our chief people officer and senior business executives.
As my partner just mentioned, we are thrilled to kick off the first half of the session with a dialogue between our very own COO of Cisco, Maria Martinez, who is the executive sponsor for the multiplier effect and an avid intentional ally, and Don Nault, a DE&I executive coach, intentional ally, and a former Cisco vice president. Don, handing it over to you to share with us what is intentional allyship and what does some of the data tell us on the impact that it has on organizations? Thank you, Carla, for that kind introduction. So let's start with definitions. What is intentional allyship? To properly define intentional allyship, let's first look at the definition of allyship. Allyship is an active and consistent effort to use one's privilege and power to support and advocate for those with less privilege and power. The key words here are active and consistent, not when it's convenient, not when it's easy. It follows then that intentional allyship involves the bold and supportive statements combined with real action, in addition to what we defined as allyship. Both the statements and the actions need to be meaningful and unconditional. So now that we have our definition, who are allies? Most of the time we think of men as allies, especially white men because they are so predominant in leadership positions throughout our organizations. But as you'll see later, it doesn't necessarily have to be. In fact, there's an imperative for it, it not to be just men. While the percentages of white men who claim their allies is increasing year over year, relatively few are performing the basic allyship actions, such as mentoring women of color, only 10%, or confronting discrimination, 39%. These data from the Lean-In and McKinsey study of 2022. In that same study, we see that between the years 2017 and 2022, in the category of all women, we've seen gains between three and seven percentage points across all leadership levels. But while the category of all women shows gains, the picture is not so rosy for women of color who significantly trail white women in all categories from 10 to 17 percentage points. This tells us that while some of our DEI activities are working, we still have a lot of work to do. Studies show that when you have gender diversity at the executive levels, firms outperform their peers by 20%. And further, if they are culturally and ethnically diverse, they are 33% more likely to experience industry-leading profitability. When we look at it from a workforce perspective, 62% of our workforces say that they consider DE&I to be an important factor in their company's ability to drive success, and firms with a diverse workforce are 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. So Maria, you're seen as an intentional ally, and you live the integration of DE&I in Cisco's business. From your perspective as Cisco's COO, why do you believe allyship is important for business? I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for it. So I, that's my, my biggest thing. I, I, uh, I carry that as a, a proof of, um, you know, knowing that when we have that there, certainly things accelerate, things become easier. Uh, we, we're there for each other to, to really have a, a safe place to, to talk about things and to, and to learn, you know, from each other. So I am a, I'm a big supporter. Maria, as a follow-up to my first question, um, you're a woman that everyone looks up to from a leadership perspective, from an executive perspective, from a woman's perspective, allies across the, across the organization. Could you share with us how you've leveraged allyship throughout your career to help you navigate? Well, thank you, Don, for that. That's a that's a really great question. Uh, I would say that early on in my career, uh, I actually benefited a lot from 
uh, allies that were mainly men, to be honest, uh, because you know when I was around when I was around earlier in my career, forty years ago, uh, we we uh, certainly didn't have a lot of women, for one, and also at that time, you know, getting that support from. Uh, other, you know, influential people, you would say in the organization, that was probably the, the biggest thing that helped me. As I, you know, got advanced more and more in my career, although that that became, you know, a, a real, uh, you know, important thing. And, and by the way, quite intentional, uh, because you have to really look for that and you need to find out who are those people and of course build, build that relationship, et cetera. As I, Went up in my career, I started relying actually a lot more in other women uh, as as uh, that could you know provide me a lot more information and connection from their own perspective to the organization, uh, and I of course started increasing you know the the number of people that I would rely on, and then of course now of course many many years later, you know, clearly having those special allies. Uh, in other women, actually, it's, it's what I rely on the most right now. Uh, uh, you know, my peers, certainly in the ELT, uh, Jerry Elliott, that is not no longer, you know, with us actively, but what someone that has been for many years, a strong, you know, ally to me where we supported each other. Those became the most meaningful because we could, could share a lot about what we're going through and together get through a lot of things that many you know other people wouldn't understand so i uh i continue to do that don and i i i'm sure it's going to be a key uh continue uh it's very special and important component uh, uh in the future thank you for that thank you with the growth of the number of women in leadership it is a cri it is critical that women leverage other women as allies while this is improving we still, again, have much work to do. It is also critical that women in leadership positions see it as an imperative that they be intentional allies in support of other women. Please note that what I'm not saying is that your personal board of allies, as I like to refer them to, um, should, I'm not saying that they should be all women. Just as leadership firms look at what they need on the board, so should all of we. That means diversity is good. People with different skills is good. People with different perspectives than you are, is also good. Maria, although you've seen, we've seen various reports that women supporting women is improving, what is your experience and how has it helped you develop a culture that encourages women to support other women? Wow, that's a lot in there, Don. But uh, I would say that, you know, clearly things have improved a lot. There's no doubt about that. I remember, you know, and I know we still have some of that, but I know early in my career, uh, you know, or, you know, certainly when you're younger uh, and are starting your career, sometimes there is women feel like they're in competition with one another because they may be perceived that, you know, you need to have you know, a woman in the team or, you know, those kinds of dynamics that happen, you know, all the time. I think that's improved a lot, but I, I think we, we have to work hard to make sure that no matter what's going on, uh, we are, we're there for one another and we develop uh, those kinds of, of responsibilities that are, are, are really important to make sure that we're advancing the overall culture and the representation that we have and the, the ability for women, you know, to have impact. Uh, as a leader, it's more important than ever uh, to be there not only as an ally and uh, being able to support, you know, as many as you have uh, at different levels, right? So all the way from at the peer level with one another, uh, I do that certainly in the ELT, we, we, we do a lot of that, uh, the, the people in our organizations, but for me, one of the things that have become really important uh, is a sponsorship, you know, being able to make sure that we're there uh, to identify, uh, you know, go out of our way to identify the people that we want to help out, that they want to be part of, you know, the future that we are, we're trying to create. And um, being there for each other allows to create that culture, not only for our own teams, but our peer groups and other organizations, certainly at Cisco, 
where these kinds of relationships become very, very important to make sure that we accelerate uh, careers and also the success of the company. Oh, thank you very much. There's a lot there. Um, and uh, so I wonder, is there anything else, Maria, that you'd like to add in terms of actions that we need to take systemically to improve women supporting women? Yeah, I say that it's sometimes, you know, uh, making sure that we are intentional about identifying where, you know, we can help, uh, where can we be there, you know, for one another, uh, especially for women that are in, uh, you know, in the unrepresented groups that are, you know, just don't get the support, you know, all the time. Uh, it's important to be there. When we talk about women, that's a broad, you know, large group, you know, of different, uh, you know, uh, kind of, you know, nationalities and, you know, different different kinds of of, uh, of, of people. And we, we think it's a, a, you know, kind of homogeneous group, but it isn't, right? So we have to make sure that through things like proximity and reaching out and being there for one another, that we can intentionally make the effort to, to make sure that we're helping out uh, as many uh, of, the, of the women uh, that we have in our teams and in other groups. As with that, we certainly uh, make, make things easier and we improve on our diversity goals. And, and, uh, but more important than, than everything for me, it's all about, it's all about having a, an impact, you know, as a company, uh, with our culture and uh, with the people that, that surround us. So um, it's very important that we make this a big, big priority as one of the things that we know have has a great impact impact in Cisco. Maria, thank you for this engaging conversation. You've shared a, 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 some great thoughts with the women and, and the allies that are attending uh, today's session. And uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time. Carla, I'll turn it over back to you and Miriam. What a powerful segment. Thank you, Maria and Don, for the informative data and inspiring experiences. So this brings us to our esteemed intentional allyship panel of executives who demonstrate allyship by walking the talk themselves. They will help us learn from their journey how to implement pragmatic, action-oriented approaches. Let me introduce this dynamic panel. Kelly Jones is our Cisco Chief People Officer Dallas Olson is Cisco's SVP of go-to-market strategy and revenue operations. Jason McLaurin is Cisco's VP of customer experience in the global enterprise segment. Many of the questions today were curated from past events and from current surveys from our members of Women of Cisco. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's kick off the first question. Don denoted earlier in the session, we're seeing an increase of women supporting women today, which is fabulous, but we still have a lot of work to do. What practical actions can we take to be allies for other women in their career journey? Thank you. First of all, thank you, Carla, for inviting me to participate in this conversation. I'm so happy to be here to, to talk about allyship. And when I think about how we can show up for other women as women, I think probably the top thing that comes to mind is just remembering that when you achieve a level of influence in your career, really at any level, when you can bring other women with you, do that. When you have an opportunity to do so, remember to do that. And this can look a lot of different ways. Allyship in my mind is about advocating for the person when they might not be in the room, or when you see something that you're not sure if it's right or it feels a little bit unfair, being able to call that out. When you witness somebody that's critical from the decision-making process that probably should be there, having the strength and the courage to call that out. And one of my favorite examples of this was actually a story from the Obama White House where there were a group of women that felt like they were getting a little bit uh, talked over in many of the strategy conversations where they were bringing ideas to the table that were either being dismissed or being taken by someone else and kind of presented as theirs. And there was a bit of a united front to say, we're gonna call this for each other. So if I see this happen to you, I'm gonna call this thing out. So it didn't feel like 
the burden was always on the person. And I just thought that was a powerful example of, of allyship. But another thing that I really think about when I think about how I show up for the women, for other women, is just the power in us being able to share our stories and our struggles, being able to be vulnerable about what you might have experienced. Because when you engage in these conversations, what you find is not everyone is having the same experience, but there are themes and patterns that tend to show up in different times in careers. Early in career women might be navigating some decisions that women like myself are a little more mature in their career may have navigated and, and dealt with. And just the perspective that you're not alone, that what you're experiencing is uh, maybe not, you're not the only person that's experienced this and that there are ways that you can kind of deal with this from a strategy standpoint, I think is really, really important. And then I would say the last thing is, you know, when we think about allyship, women and women, there's women and women, there's also men and women. And I think with men, when we think about how men can show up as allies, it's a little bit about being educated on how this might show up, how differences might show up as part of the system versus an individual interaction. So you can really identify when these types of things happen. Because the reality is, it's hard to spot things when you don't consider, when it's not something that happens to you. You know, so it's for the open-minded men that we work with around this, it's really good to be able to like, explore and under, understand how the perspective of some of the women they work with might be a little bit different. Oh, that was powerful. So have you, uh, this next question is, is a fantastic question. And I know um, many, many of us have been wanting to ask, I think, Kelly this question or, or an executive this question. Would love to know from you, have you personally experienced a female boss who didn't have your back, how did you overcome that? Oh, yes, I have. Um, I've experienced that. And I've also experienced incredibly strong allyship and sponsorship from some of my male bosses in the past. So I will just kind of say that, that like, uh, it is not good or bad binary. And I've certainly experienced that. And I would actually say in this situation, I'm recalling um, the person, she didn't have my back but she didn't have anybody's back on the team. You know, she was really just a poor leader. Um, this is particularly frustrating for women when you get women leaders that are like this, because I think we have this assumption that maybe they've gone on the same journey we have or a version of it, as I mentioned earlier, and they might have a slightly different point of view and, you know, understand the road we've been on. Um, but in this case, this person definitely didn't. So what I think is most important in this, and I'll share this with you, this was earlier in my career, and the way that I handled it was I gave feedback to this person about how I was experiencing them. Because it is important to assume best intent. My assumption was she wasn't trying to create this environment for me. She wasn't trying to uh, be the person that was stealing the ideas of everyone on the team. It was just happening that way. And so I approached it with best intent to give her some feedback on how I was experiencing her. Um, I didn't see a behavior change in that. So I actually changed teams. I think the most important thing from this though, I will say, is I learned a lot about how to not be a leader. You know, when you experience bosses like that of any gender, you really take with you into your next encounter as a people leader, how it's really important to not show up for people. Wow, how insightful. Thank you, Kelly, for that response. Um, so let's move our conversation to our other panelists. Dallas, based on your experience, how can allyship be fostered in large organizations? Yeah, Marion, that is a question with depth. For sure. I, I think there are three things that we can do. And before I get into those three things around fostering allyship at scale in a large organization, uh, I think about where does this opportunity present itself or the lack of the opportunity to present itself inside of a company? This is important, I think, for us to understand. So I think about where does allyship show up at work and where may it not show up at work? And I think about things like everyday interactions, you know, in the break room or the lunchroom. I think about workplace norms and expectations that are set inside of the company, things like hiring, mentorship and sponsorship, which I think are enormously important, and then advancement and recognition. I think these are all areas where we see allyship work and at times we see allyship in its absence. Uh, and and that's, that's the baseline. Now, when I think about what can we actually do, Miriam, I think there are three things. The first is development. I think the foundational element for us is to help our people understand what is allyship, why is it really important, and how do you actually become an ally? Now, I know that sounds very simple, 
but I think a lot of times it's taken for granted. And so I think there's an opportunity inside of an, a large organization to have everyone at every level when they join the company understand what is allyship, you know, why is it really important and, and, and how can you actually become an ally? Once that foundation is in place, I think the second thing that you can do to foster allyship is execution. Now, execution is something that's very easy to say, very hard to do. It can also sound like a buzzword, but here's what I mean about execution. And, and I'll reference Carla and an experience I had with Carla Rivera several years ago. Carla and I were having a conversation around allyship, sponsorship, mentorship, diversity. And she said to me, Dallas, do you believe that all of those things are a business problem? And I said, you know, Carla, for sure, I believe that they're a moral and ethical problem and obligation. And I do, I do believe that it's a, a business problem for, for large companies. And she said, why? And I shared a few things. And, and Carla said, hmm, you know, that's interesting, Dallas. And essentially what she was saying is, I think you need to do your homework. And so I did. I went off and did my homework. And I came back to Carla in our next conversation. And I said, Carla, it is emphatically a business problem. Emphatically. And here's why. I said, um, companies that have diversity uh, experience two and a half times higher uh, cash flow per employee than companies that do not. Companies that have allyship and diverse management teams experience 19% increase in revenue versus companies that do not. Um, gender diverse companies typically perform 15% better than their peers at, in, in their industry. And then lastly, one of the other stats that I thought was really impressive is that three out of four workers uh, and um, and potential job seekers want to be in a company that's diverse. And when I thought about all of those areas, when I thought about cash flow, that's the PL. When I thought about revenue, that's growth. When I thought about you know, being better than your peers, that's about market share. And then three out of four workers, uh, that's really about recruiting, retention, onboarding, and, and having the best talent you can possibly have. So I said, Carla, it is emphatically a business challenge and business problem. And then she hit me with her second or third question which was, well, then why don't we approach it and attack it like we do all of the other business problems that we face on a day-to-day -day basis? And again, I said, it's a very powerful question and statement, Carla, and I'm going to go do my homework. And I came back in our following conversation, and I said, look, here's how we do this in terms of execution. We use all of the tools that we use on a normal day-to-day -day basis, and I don't know why that we haven't done this in the past, but but using analysis in the frameworks that exist, like Six Sigma and Lean and Agile and Design, and then doing the most important thing in terms of execution, taking all of that as a business problem and creating expectations. And I think things like metrics, visibility, accountability are very, very important in terms of driving execution around allyship. Now, the last thing that I think we can do, Miriam, is I think that we can foster uh, allyship is an integral part of our, our culture. Now, again, that sounds very easy to say. It's very hard to do. But I think that the use of storytelling is very, very powerful. And I'll share an example with you. Years ago, I was invited to speak to the CSAP group here at Cisco. And if you aren't familiar with CSAP, that stands for the Cisco Sales Associate Program. And essentially, we go out and we recruit people that have just graduated out of school and we put them in a two-year intensive training program. And following a presentation that I made to this group, uh, we were in Q&A and a lady raised her hand and she said, Dallas, I am very interested in finding a female executive inside of Cisco that can become an ally, a sponsor, a mentor to me. And it is very hard for me to find that. And how do I do that? How do I make that happen? And I said, before I answer your question, I have a question for all of the men in the room. And I said to all of the men, being very honest, when you heard this question from one of your peers, did you feel that that was specifically her request? And because it was her request and, and her desire, it was essentially her problem. Did, and, and not that there's anything wrong or bad about what you thought, but did you mentally process that as that's her situation and her issue? And a lot of hands went up and I said, yeah, being honest, I did. I thought that was her ask and, and her challenge. And I said, Here's what you all need to understand, and I'm speaking directly to the men in the room, and that is, is that there is an inequity here because three out of 10 people inside this company are female. This was at the time, and seven out of 10 people are male. And so your peers in this room are gonna have a tougher time if they want a female executive, finding a female executive, because all of our executives have upwards of 10, 20, sometimes 30 
mentorships, sponsorships, allyships that they're actively engaged in. And so there's an obligation for the men to play a bigger role here. And so I turned back to her and I said, that's why it's hard. Now we can help you find allyship inside the company for certain. Um, but I closed with that uh, experience with that team by saying, look, there's an opportunity for everyone in this room, first to close the gap over time. And then secondly, to make sure that allyship, sponsorship, mentorship is at the forefront of your thinking as you progress throughout your career. Now, the special part about this story and this experience is that within the last year to two years, I've had upwards of 20 people from that cohort come back to me and say, you know, Dallas, when you shared that information and you shared that story and you talked to us, it was a paradigm shift for me personally. And I vowed at that moment that I was gonna do something about this throughout my career. And all of those people, male and female, are now leaders, they're first line leaders. Some of them are second line leaders in the organization and it's become a de facto standard in how they're leading inside of their teams in the organization. They're putting allyship at the forefront of what they wanna try and do to support women inside the company, male and female in terms of leadership. And that was incredibly powerful. So I think the use of storytelling to embed this and to nurture allyship inside of our culture is really, really important. So the summary, Miriam, is, you know, I think the foundational layer is development followed by execution, which is approaching this as a business problem. And then nurturing our ability to execute inside of our culture through storytelling will, I think, truly make a difference for us in the future. Thank you for that response, Dallas. Jason, over to you. Don, talk about the gap between intent and action and allyship. What would you say are actions leaders can take to be an intentional ally for women in the workplace? Thank you, Miriam. I think it's it's a great question, and I appreciate you having me on this panel. Um, before I answer the question about specific activities, I think it was very interesting to hear Kelly and Carla talk earlier about how women can be allies for other women, and really listening to their story, their personal journey through their careers, and the perspectives that they gained through that, that, that career, and understanding that most men um, can never really fully appreciate that. They've not been through the same experience. In fact, male allyship involves men supporting women through a journey that they've not personally experienced. And so because of this, men will go through their own personal journey um, toward allyship. And it will sometimes be uncomfortable. It requires self-reflection and we will make mistakes. And, and this is really what learning is all about is do what you can at the time. You learn, improve, and then do better. Um, and so personally for me, I'm going through my own journey from an unintentional ally to where I am today. And I often make mistakes. Um, I'm often in <laughs> uncomfortable situations. And just to give you some examples, I, um, I mentor females um, and have, you know, th throughout the last uh, you know, 10 years or so. And I've, um, I have situations where females tell me firsthand about things like menopause or sexual harassment that they've experienced in Cisco or discrimination through their career journey. And that's very difficult to sit and listen to as, as a male. And so my recommendation to male allies is stay in that difficult situation, get proximate with the individual, learn and grow through it. And really you will not get to be an intentional ally until you get through it and work through that difficulty and understand it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to mess up. Um, so back to your question, Miriam, I think you know, beyond our own personal journey, what are the pragmatic steps that we can take? And, and I think Maria said it beautifully earlier that we need to move from intent to action. That's what this, this theme is around is. And really for me, anybody can be an intentional ally, whether you're a people leader or an individual contributor, you can all contribute to building the better work environment. Um, so first, if you're a people leader, you know that hiring and retention are critical for Cisco to continue to build a diverse workforce. And, and, and Dallas just went through some you know, you know, qualitative measures around what that means to, to the business. But really for me, it's simple math. If your attrition of diverse talent is more than you're hiring, you're going in the wrong direction. And so really we need to understand that, that mix. Um, and if you're a hiring manager, ensuring that you have a diverse interview panel and a diverse candidate pool is fundamental. And I've you know, been a manager for a while and I sometimes hear the challenge from my you know, male hiring managers or colleague male hiring managers that says, 
you know what, Jason, I just can't find any female candidates. So I'm just going to put everyone as a male candidate. And it's interesting because at the same time they're telling me that, I observe other female hiring managers that are peers that are hiring for a similar role. And they have over half their candidates as female in the candidate pool. And so they're obviously doing something right. And so I encourage uh, male hiring managers, if you're, if you're struggling to find female candidate pools, talk to your female peers or those in your team on suggestions on how to build a more diverse candidate pool. Uh, a few other topics to, to go through. One is on talent retention. If you talk about hiring, now let's go into talent retention. And for me, there's really two areas around talent retention to go through. One is workplace environment, and one is career advancement. And they both play a role that, that male allies can influence and help you retention. And so, not sure if you saw, but a few weeks ago, Chuck and Fran recently shared the female quotient. It's, it's a report and very interesting to read through. And in that report, there is some data, very interesting data about the workplace environment. And one specific set talked about the impact of the workplace on retention and looked at topics like remote work, collaboration, and building a supportive workplace, all which, it's, which drive retention and improvement of retention. So again, regardless of whether you're a manager or not, there are steps that you can take towards building a supportive workplace. Number one, in, such as immediately recognizing and removing toxicity from the workplace. That's pretty obvious glaring in your face. Um, but another thing you can do is, and there's a, there's a question that I get, almost every mentor mentee relationship I have, the first question I get is, Jason, how can I break into conversations and how can I be heard? Almost by and large, that's the first question I get. And so my ask is to understand how to address that question and be proactive to, to make sure female employees have a seat at the table and are heard, um, make space in the conversations so that all voices and ideas are heard. Um, and sometimes, honestly, that means that we and you need to talk less. So you make space for, for other uh, people to contribute. Um, so really, in summary, one of the areas around tension is create that environment of inclusion and belonging. And the last thing I'll mention is around supporting career advancement through mentoring and sponsorship. And Don shared some data earlier and, and, and Dallas just went through it a bit as, as well, that there is a disparity between the percentage of men that consider themselves mentors and the percentage of women who feel they have a mentor. There's a big, there's a big difference. And so many men will raise their hand and say, yep, I'm a mentor, but they're really not. And so the first thing for me is to know the difference between coaching, mentoring, and sponsorship. And for me, coaching is really performance or role related, whereas mentoring is career and development focused and looks beyond the current job and sometimes a multi-year journey. Um, and sponsoring involves using your power and influence to advocate for someone else, especially when they're not in the room. And, and Kelly mentioned some of this earlier. And all these aspects of career development are important, but if you're mentoring someone, ask you to reflect on the type of, type of conversation you're having and challenge yourself to get more proximate with someone, become a mentor and sponsor and help them through their career journey. And likely you will gain value out of the relationship as much as the mentee. And just an example, I was um, mentoring someone uh, earlier this week and they were asking for some guidance on interviewing for the first manager position, a big, big step for them. And someone I've been mentoring for over a year now and still, as I talked through this individual, I took a page of notes on learnings that I got from them, as well as reflections I had when I was talking to that, that individual. Um, so it's quite powerful. And so the ask is start your journey from coaching, mentoring, and sponsoring. Ask the right questions and, and share your experiences and you'll grow as well. So I just wanna bring this back full circle to um, Miriam, to, the, to you, to the individuals, the allies, and their journey is really take that first step and turn that intent into action. This is such a great session. We cannot let you go yet. <laughs> We've got to go to one more question, if you don't mind. But it is going to be rapid fire, one to two minutes, if that, if that, if you're, you all are okay with it. I, hopefully I'll see some head nods. All right, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I know everyone's on the edge of their seat. I know I was <laughs> leaning forward and got myself because um, this, this is just so impactful. Um, so one question 
How do you keep your organization accountable from intent to action? We talked a lot about metrics, a lot about performance, a lot about business impact. It's so powerful. Um, but how do you, in your organization, um, how, how do you really look at the accountability from intent to action in that sense, from a metrics perspective? Yeah, I'm happy to take that first on the rapid fire. Um, Dallas mentioned metrics. I wholeheartedly agree. I was shaking my head as he was talking. You know, at Cisco, it really matters to us what it is that we measure. And in my organization, that displays through our INC action plans. And that's everything from hiring to proximity to participation in the multiplier effect. And we measure all of these things heavily within our organization. We're a little bit different in some of our action goals for INC, however, because we are a people and communities function, which is very traditionally female. So we actually have the reverse in some cases of our INC action plans where we're consciously trying to bring more men into the conversation to have a more diverse team. But it's definitely through our action plans. It's through ensuring that our leaders display the right activities through listening, through check-ins and through pulse. Yeah, Carla, I, I will, I will uh, echo Kelly's comments. And I think that that is the most important baseline or, or the metrics that you put in place because that creates visibility and accountability. I think one of the things that, that we do that I, I you know, stumbled into, honestly, I can't say that we did this intentionally, but, but I learned and our team learned was that you know, change occurs through dialogue. And so the, the simple act of me reserving time on every single leadership call and having our leaders reserve time on their leadership calls to have the dialogue around mentorship, sponsorship, allyship, hiring, all of these things, continuously talking about this allows people to learn, to engage, to be vulnerable, you know, as Jason called out, to make mistakes. That simple time for people to just come in and, and, and progress in terms of their understanding and their ability to execute uh, has been transformative. So that's one of the ways that we do it as well as we just create the room and the constant conversation around uh, the ability to have dialogue on what does it mean and what do we need to do. All right, that, and I'll add as well. Um, obviously, you know, metrics are critical in, in, in Cisco. We have tons of metrics and data showing us how our org is, is aligned and meeting goals. But for me, it, it goes a bit beyond that because you know, what are the specific actions that myself or my leaders can take to influence your org? And that's, you know, that's um, when I talk to them, I say, what are, the, what are you doing? How are you working with PNC? How are you taking the programs at a Cisco level and bringing them down to your group? And what are you trying to, to get to? So I look at specific actions, um, but also through those conversations, I get to a point where I'm understanding why the leaders are doing something. And uh, some leaders do activities because they're being measured. And some of them do activities because they believe it. And it's, it's really what I'm trying to drive is, is that belief, that fundamental understanding of why this is imperative from a business and a moral standpoint and how to progress in those areas. This area. So it's a bit of what Kelly and Dallas said, but a bit beyond in terms of what's the, the core belief in the person as well. It's incredible. Thank you. Great, great answers. Really appreciate your different perspectives. And I love to see this allyship and DE&I conversation uh, and where it's evolving. So fantastic. So our gratitude uh, to Maria, Don, Kelly, Dallas, and Jason for all of the wisdom and authentic um, conversations that you bring forth here to help us bridge the chasm between intent and action in allyship. Also a huge shout out to the Women of Impact leads and committee members helping us to bring this session to you. Our call to action today is twofold. First, check out our many allyship programs to educate yourself and participate. Secondly, use this QR code on your screen to get information and resources about intentional allyship. I hope you enjoyed your, this session and we are not done yet. Join us next session with our new Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, Gloria Goins, and Women of Cisco Executive Sponsors, Rachel Barger and Denise Lee, about leveraging inclusive communities for your future. Thank you for joining.
I immigrated to this country in 1975, and I didn't even know the alphabet. So I didn't speak any English. I stuck out like a sore thumb. Mary and I first met in sixth grade in Vienna, Virginia in 1975. She joined our sixth grade class at Marshall Road Elementary School, and I was asked to help Mary learn English. The teacher sent us to a private room. They gave us three Sears catalogs. We got a notebook, we got some scissors and some paste, and... Cut out pictures, paste them in a notebook, spell out the item, and that's how I learned English. Mary showed me how to be brave. I'm very, very grateful because it made me who I am today. I am a Cisco account manager. I love what I do because sales is all about grit and problem solving. I had a client that had an issue. I contacted a coworker uh, about the issue. Once the issue was resolved, I started receiving IMs from that coworker saying, Did you go to elementary school in Vienna? Yes. Marshall Road. Moved to the U.S. in the sixth grade? Yes, I didn't know how to speak English. Oh my gosh, Judy? Yep, it was actually Mary. It was the girl from Marshall Road Elementary School that I taught English to. Judy, how long has it been? My gosh, I finally get to see you. 40-something years. <laughs> oh, it's great to see Good you. Good to see you. I think one of the things that makes this special and reconnecting with you is special is um, really seeing how willing you were to learn, how eager you were to learn. And look at you now, the top 1% of the Cisco sales force, Cisco Hall of Fame, and that desire for learning and improvement really resonates with me because it represents a way in which we can be most successful for our customers and help them the most. Then use some of those same practices and behaviors that we learned yeah. as schoolmates together. And now you we're know? teammates again, collaborating again, working together to solve yeah. problems for the customer. Absolutely. I think that's like, you know, we, we brought this whole thing full circle. Where will you be in five years? Where will we be in five years? In 25? In 50? Let's be here and here with her and him and they. Let's connect them. Let's connect everyone. Let's deliver technology that gives them access to power opportunity. Let's set a new standard for data security and personal privacy. Let's change the system promote equality and fairness in the workplace. Let's tear down the barriers to social justice for a more inclusive world. Let's clean house, zero carbon, zero waste. Because the health of our family is tied to the future of our home. Let's gather resources and partners, steer toward our greatest challenges and accelerate. For the benefit, for all. Cisco has made it its purpose to power an inclusive future for all. Where will we be in 50 years? Let's go see. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Humans and nature. We're in this together. Yet nature has given and given. It's our turn to do more. Cisco Smart Building Solutions and our partner's technology benefit both humans and nature. Catalyst switches connect securely, delivering power over Ethernet, reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. Cisco Wireless and DNA Spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet. And collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco. 
the bridge to possible. Welcome, Women of Impact. Hope you have enjoyed the broadcast so far. It's been a great day of sharing and celebrating our theme of Powered by Purpose. I'm Mona Hudak, and along with my co-host, Jen Vela, partner on the Women of Cisco America's Attract Pillar. We are thrilled to bring you our final topic, which will focus on leveraging inclusive communities to own your future. We have a fantastic panel of leaders who are generously providing their experiences and their perspectives on how leveraging inclusive communities can play a part in your journey. So let's first introduce our panel. Welcome, Gloria Goins. She has recently joined Cisco as our Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer. She is a dynamic senior business executive with a rare background in operations, sales, marketing, diversity and inclusion, corporate social responsibilities, human resources, and law. This leader brings it all. Rachel Barger is our Senior Vice President for America Sales and the Global Women of Cisco co-executive sponsor. As a seasoned leader, she is passionate about building high-performing teams and a culture that empowers individuals to adopt a growth mindset and drive innovation with a truly diverse, inclusive, and collective perspective. Denise Lee is our Vice President of Engineering Sustainability Office and is America's Women of Cisco co-executive sponsor. She brings extensive fun functional depth in strategy, sales, operations, customer success, and engineering. Her key strengths target strategic leadership, customer success, and life cycle management, and exemplary go-to-market strategy. Tony DeGru is our leader in service delivery and the global lead for men for inclusion. Tony is a solutions strategist with a track record of delivering outstanding results and insights to drive solution adoption and business growth. He is extremely passionate about inclusion and allyship for those who are marginalized or underrepresented in our society and workplaces. Barley Salazar is our HR country lead consultant for Canada and LATAM and is here representing Conexion. Marley is a catalyst for innovative initiatives that address today's business challenges. She transitions underperforming organizations into highly effective ones, as well as partnering organizations through accelerated growth or rapid change. Rachel Waters is our leader in systems engineering and is here representing connected black professionals. She supports powering an inclusive future for all, starting with developing our next generation leaders and inclusive teams. She cites that experience really is the best teacher and reinforces that knowledge is power. Chanel Davis is our Women of Cisco Pil Pillar co-lead and is here representing Women of Cisco. She prides herself on learning from the best, Lini leading from behind and servicing the community. She is a firm believer that the best communicators understand the intersectionability of intersectionality of people, products, and culture. Annie Hardy is a senior visioneer, founder of Chickenomics, and is here representing women in science and engineering. Her expertise ranges from product innovation to research and strategy for global tech companies. She delights in championing human-centered ideas, 
productive collaborations, and leading innovation on her teams. So welcome all the panelists. Let's get you warmed up with just a couple of rapid fire questions. We're gonna give you each 30 seconds to respond. How's that? So this first question is going to be for Annie, Marley, Rachel W, and Chanel. Okay, you've stopped. You're stopped in the middle of a hallway. And let's say it's a new Cisco leader. And they're asking you, what does inclusive communities mean to you? Let's start with Annie. Oh my goodness, what does inclusive communities mean to me? What an amazing question and what a challenging question. Um, I think at the beginning, what I would have thought of as uh, inclusive communities is a community that I'm a part of. Um, but what's been interesting is for me to adopt and adapt to learn that inclusive communities are also inclusive of communities I want to learn more about and want to empathize with. So I'm uh, uh, part of Women of Cisco, for instance, um, part of WISE, but I'm also part of Men for Inclusion. And so inclusive communities for me are looking at not just being in a community that represents who we are, but also learning from communities who represent what we're not so that we can empathize and become more proximate to the experiences of people who are different from us. That's my 30 seconds. Great, great. Thanks, Annie. Marley. It is indeed a great question. So I'm going to say that for me, inclusive communities uh, are those communities where people can be their own selves without fear. I'm feeling that by being their own selves, they're bringing their whole value into the table. So that's what it means to me. Yeah, great, great. Rachel W. Thanks for the question and, and thanks for the introduction, Mona. Great job. I think, you know, inclusive communities are a safe place. Um, it's something really special inside of Cisco where you can learn from a community and gain so much more perspective. And um, whether you're feeling courageous or curious, I think there's a place for you in one of our communities. Great, great job. Chanel. That's a great tie in. I agree with Rachel. When I think of inclusive communities, I think of a safe place to land, somewhere where I can be with my own people. So I'm a part of Women of Cisco because I'm a woman. I'm a part of CDP because I'm a Black woman. I'm a part of WISE because I love everything science and technology and education, and I'm definitely a confessed math nerd. And I'm proud to be a Pride ally, and I get to officiate my best friend marriage to her partner this fall. So. I can't say enough about what inclusive communities means to me, and I hope it means just as much to everyone else. Great, great answers, everyone. So this next question is for our leaders. Can you share just a snippet of your experience or journey as a leader related to equity and inclusion? Can we start with Rachel B? Sure. Thanks so much, Mona. And so good to be with everybody here today. And for me, you know, being inclusive and diverse in, in our teams is about, you know, hearing from all of the perspectives and ideas that are out there. When we you think about any situation that you're in, if you're only with one particular group that has had one particular experience, it's impossible to really get the best possible outcome and answer. It's impossible to really be empathetic for all of the different situations that might be having so that might be happening. So I'd really just say it's about better teams, you know, if if you're all always thinking about the same thing and have the same background, it's impossible to to really get the you know, the richness of the solutions and the innovation that we can all come up with. So better performing teams and more fun teams too in the end. Yeah, bringing that fun. Yes. Tony, let's let's hear from you. You know, in, in addition to like fishbowl exercises, which we do as part of Men for Inclusion, what I really love about the fact is when we think about Men for Inclusion in particular is that we don't tie to a specific affinity group. And so we will spark conversations in our WebEx space around issues of inclusion and belonging, because I think it really helps men to navigate this whole thing, right? So do we, how do we get in touch with our feelings? How do we support those who are different from us? And to have dialogue around that. And so being able to do that in a community where it's safe and inviting and, and we're and gathering different perspectives. And I love in particular, the perspectives that Annie will shed on you know, in those spaces and really allow us to dig into 
those things that are really meaningful and help us to be able to contribute to our inclusive future. Great, great. Denise, let's hear your perspective. Oh, this is so inspiring to be with all of you here today. Um, when I think of inclusive and diverse communities and being leader, I have to say it's sort of a core part of my ethos, um, having been a long time Silicon Valley um, you know, native. For me, it drives innovation. It drives that change. It drives the speed and pace of, of what we are all striving for, which is this better inclusive future for all. Um, I think about some of these words that I keep hearing as themes, but between empathy um, and diversity, I've always held that a good idea can come from anywhere. And unless you have that diversity of talent around the table and you're listening and you're bringing all the right skill sets and strengths from all dimensions, um, you won't you won't get that. So for me personally, especially with the work that I'm doing now, I would just simply say it helps to accelerate the speed of innovation and change. Um, and, and you're doing that by listening to everyone around the table. Yes, great call out, great call out. Gloria. Yeah, thanks so much, Mona, for that introduction. As you all may have gleaned from that, I've, I've worn a lot of hats, but a critical part of my journey has been equity and inclusion has really been a part of my life as a leader and as a person. And I just fully believe that we can unleash everyone's full potential when we can step into each other's shoes. It's that proximity that Annie talked about. And for me, I've actually been attracted to Cisco because we've made a commitment to be intentional and purposeful. And I'm just really excited about the immense opportunity we have as an organization to, through the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, not only have an impact on our company, but on the world. And when people ask me, what can they do? They can do something as simple as asking themselves, whose voice is missing? Mm. And then taking the next step to actively removing the barriers to those voices and bringing those voices to the table. Great, great call out. So Gloria, I'm going to keep you uh, on the hot seat there. Let's shift to a question specifically for you. So with your extensive background and experience, how would you suggest that inclusive communities be leveraged to support the employee's experience and journey? And that's such a great question. You know, what we know from evidence and research is that our employees are going to be more engaged. They're going to be more innovative. They're going to have a greater sense of belonging when they have a community of like-minded people and allies. And our inclusive communities provide a mechanism for networking and connection, which is so critical to everybody's employee journey, no matter where they are in their careers. And all of us operate at our best, at the highest superpowers, when we have a community that inspires us and provides us that space that we've all talked about for networking, for authenticity, and for professional development. And so the 28 inclusive communities that we have here at Cisco provide an amazing and dynamic platform for not only connection for those who demographically represent those communities, but for their allies as well. Because one of the things that I constantly try to remind everyone across Cisco is no matter who you are, no matter where you are, all of us can be an ally for someone else, right? Because we all have a voice or a position or a privilege or a power that's greater than someone else's. And we don't need the, a tap on the shoulder or a promotion to step into that allyship. So that's my way of saying that all Ciscoians should be able to see themselves in our inclusive communities, either as a reflection of those communities or as an ally. And what I love about our inclusive communities is that they also facilitate innovation as well as that personal and professional development. And when our employees participate in those communities, they come back to their own teams with the highest level of their superpowers because they're bringing back the, the, the fruit of being connected, of being engaged, of being seen, and they're bringing back new ideas and new energy. And so by participating in those inclusive communities, we start to build that inclusive leadership muscle, right? It's that proximity of being around others who may be different from us that helps us build empathy and connection 
which we know from research are critical leadership skills, no matter where we sit in our organization. Great, great position. Well said. Thank you for that. Rachel B., from your professional perspective, how do inclusive communities support the business? So I think there are really two aspects to it. There's the internal aspect about ensuring that that you know, sort of as Rachel Waters said, uh, that that we have the the structure and the the comfort and the excitement within our own teams, and the right culture within our own teams to foster inquisitiveness and foster growth, to foster innovation. That's one aspect. But there's also another aspect. There's actually a true bottom line aspect um, related to having diverse teams. And there's been a ton of research done on this. For example, Boston Consulting Group, uh, they did a survey of over, over 1,700 companies across eight countries and found that companies with more diverse workforces and that prioritize diversity in their teams generated 19% more revenue from innovation. Again, diversity leads to different thoughts and leads to innovation. And they were 70% more likely to capture new markets early. Again, thinking outside the box, seeing things with different perspectives. And I also really liked a Deloitte study that's been recently done that found that having diverse teams increases innovation by 20%. And also, it helps to spot risk and reduce risk by 30%. Again, when you have groupthink is when you have risk to the business, where everybody's looking at the, a problem or an issue in a certain way, and they're not seeing the alternative perspective. So I think it's really important first to understand there is a bottom line impact, and, and these are real stories across real companies. I think the other thing to think about is, you know, the thing that I am hyper-focused on is showing up the best possible way to support our customers and inspire them to look at us as a strategic partner. And I have to be honest, I had an experience a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, where a very critical, large global brand, an executive reached out to me and said, hey, I was really um, you know, confused and concerned about how your team showed up. We had about 10 people in a room with this particular customer. And we only had one individual of any type of diverse classification in that room. And the way that the customer showed up is they had probably across their 10 folks, 10 or 11 folks, they had probably 15 different lenses of diversity that was reflected in their team. And why did that matter to that executive? That particular brand, they look at their customer base and their customer base is incredibly diverse. They're every type of diversity you can think of. They're a, they're a global retail brand, okay? And that's an actual pride point for them about how they show up and understand their customer. And so it was a concern point for them about, could we really not only understand them and their team, but their end customers? Because that's at the end of the day, what we do as Cisco is enable our customers to deliver amazing experiences to their employees and to their customers. And so I really, I really would like to challenge each and every one of us to think about how we show up and why it matters. It's not just a, a tick in the box to say, oh yes, you know, you know, diversity is important. Well, why is it important? How do we show up and, and really show that? And then the last thing that I'd say is so many of us, we're in our professions because we're continuous learners. We love learning. We love continuing to grow and challenge, you know, our viewpoints on things. There is no better way to be inquisitive than to get involved with an ERO that you are not a part of. I'm a super uh, proud part of our, of course, Women of Cisco communities and our pride communities. That really means something to me. But I'm also in, an incredibly inquisitive ally of our connected black professional community. I don't know what it's like um, to be a person of color working in the world. And, and But what I can do is I can really lean in and want to learn and understand and be proximate. And I think that that's, you know, it's so important. And this isn't for me. It's from Brian Stevenson from the executive, who's the executive director of Equal Justice uh, Initiative. But he said, when we get proximate to a problem, we feel compelled to solve it. And for me, that is 100% the case. And I'd really, you know, challenge each and every one of you that it's probably the case for yourself as well. We have to understand the problems, get proximate to them and feel them so that we can really be inspired to take action. And when we all feel inspired to take action, to drive for more inclusivity and, and diversity, 
we can all be our authentic selves and we can all do a lot more and feel a lot better doing it. Yeah, there were a lot of nods going on here. So a lot of heads were nodding. We were in complete agreement and really were inspired by that, Rachel. Thank you very much. Denise, how can you share how women of Cisco Americas might support women in Cisco throughout their journey? Thanks so much, Mona. Uh, you know, Women of Cisco is the largest ERO and it's probably the most mature. Um, I've had the pleasure of being part of Cisco for well over a decade and I've been part of EROs as a leader and as an active participant since I came in the door. And it's such a huge benefit. You know, I loved you know, Rachel's stats. Um, there was also McKinsey studies done in addition to Deloitte and Accenture. And some of these stats really stood out to me that are still true, right? And I look at the stats when I came in the door and 10 years later, plus <clears throat> they're still here. So one is um, based on this McKinsey study, women are two times as likely as men to be mistaken for someone more junior. Um, also two times as likely women leaders are two times as likely to spend more time in DEI uh, focused work. And when we think about those two things together, and Rachel's point, which also is, again, backed up by research, that it helps the business overall growth, right? These are no longer nice to have, makes you feel good to just be part of a community, which it is. It's amazing to be feel, you know, to be part of these communities, to have fun and to make to make friends and colleagues in the workplace. But it's it's more than that, right? Companies that have better representation of women, especially women of color, are seen and data are saying go further, not only further from DEI metrics, but in the business growth, in the innovation, and in the diversity of thought in these programs. So when you take this data and then you say, well, I accept Rachel's challenge to, to make a difference and to incite action based on all of these things, what can uh, you know, women of Cisco in this ERO, along with the other EROs, do? Well, we're looking at attracting, developing, and retaining as well as celebrating all the women who are part of this. And there are 9,000 men and women at large across women of Cisco, nine, over 9,000, right? And when we think about the allyship and the communities that we're trying to build, the small mini waves in our local communities, what does that mean across these 69 countries and these 76 chapters? I've had the pleasure of sitting on the board and chapter and looking at how the, how the programs are designed globally as well as locally. And I think it's so important to really understand that it, it, it requires both. As a cultural community, we are all Ciscoanians and we hold that Cisco badge, but in our local communities, there's a lot we can do and we need to differentiate and make space for that because it looks different. The programs, the people, the, the matters that need to be addressed look different depending on where you are in the world. And so when I consider the allyship and the development that we're trying to do both professionally and, and personally, this year, uh, the programs are designed around business readiness, right? So developing and how we can train to advance, uh, to Rachel's point, how are we driving actual business growth? The executive shadow program, which is, which is you know, we're looking to increase the executive exposure, the number of people going through the programs and those matchings, as well as just career velocity. And I think there's been a really, um, a lot of emphasis on movement around the company. Um, you know, both with the rebalancing as well as encouraging people to try different things in different functions. Um, and, you know, from Gloria's background, I know I've had, I've had the pleasure of working in a lot of different functions at this company. Um, it really sheds light on diversity of thought. Uh, it's a different type of diversity to bring that skill set diversity to your, your different role. Um, Rachel, when you were talking about your customer example, I would love to share just a, a quick one of mine. For so many years of my career, I was the only in the room, right? And I'm sure many of us can attest to what that feels like. Um, recently, I was asked to join a CXC because the leader of this pretty traditional company in the oil and gas industry um, looked more like me than anyone else in the room. And I was, for the first time ever, asked to join, not just because of the skill set and the, and the work at hand, but because somebody like me was in the room from the customer side leading. So Rachel, Rachel when we think about our customers looking at who they want to partner with um, and, and trusted partners and vendors that they see and shared collective purpose and value set, 
Um, I just have to say, you know, there's a bit of hope and optimism, um, having gone from the only in the room to being asked um, to join uh, because uh, because of those those things that maybe once held me back. So, with that, I would just say, as you know, as as a leader and looking at women of Cisco or any URO that you may participate in, um, actively or passively, there's so many opportunities and programs that are designed, um, and it's it's for you to take advantage of. I hope. Great, great, great. And this is a great segue um, into the next question. So let's let's hear from Tony and get an ally perspective. Tony, can you provide some examples that men for inclusion are implementing today? Thank you so much for that. And I love hearing from Rachel and from Denise. I love what you all bring to this conversation. And I just hope that what we do as men for inclusion and what I do personally contributes to that. So first of all, when I think about Men for Inclusion, we are an advisory network that strives to accelerate, activate, and develop male leaders and influencers to use their influence to help address the issues that we face within Cisco and within the broader communities in which we live. What's really interesting when we think about how do we support women of Cisco, we know that allyship, and I, and I, and I, love, and I, and I have a love-hate relationship with that term, and I'm gonna cover that in my, a little later. But when I think about it, it's, Allyship cannot be performative. It cannot be. It's not something that you turn on when you walk in the doors of Cisco. It's something that you have to do and be. And one of the areas we talk about pay gap, but one of the things that's really, really interesting is if you think about what the what the um, the last couple of years have brought us with regards to the pandemic is that the, the women unfortunately had by and large who were in homes where, where they shared with husbands did more or husbands or male partners, I would say, did more of the actual labor in the home in addition to having to have a full-time position. And that's not fair, it's really not. And so our allyship is not just something that we do at work, but it has to be something that we do at home. But then when I think about it from just a, a, a process, right? We know that over the last couple of years, the muscle that men in particular have, have, have built up in this space is somewhat atrophied and, and they feel less involved. They feel less communicated to. Perhaps their, their circles of influence have shrunk because they haven't had access. And so how do we how do we build that muscle, that allyship muscle back up? And I encourage men and I always say that I cannot claim myself to be an ally unless you say that I'm an ally for you. So how do we demonstrate that behavior? How do we align ourselves to do that? Think about the women who we encounter, not only as coworkers, but think about that. Think of them as our wives, our daughters, our sisters, our mothers, and, and, and love on them. And the love is the root of everything that we do. I tell people all the time, my faith informs my, my everything that I do. And so if I can't love you as, my, as I do myself, then I'm failing to be who, the person that I've been called to be. And so with that, I think it's really important that we help men understand that. And, and with MFI, because we are not necessarily tied to an affinity group, we serve as an onboard to allow men to say, here's where you can fit in and help women for inclusion or women of Cisco. Here's how you can step in and help and align yourself with the folks of pride. And so having that diverse perspective, being able to have conversations as men, how do we do this? And how do we do this and, and live within our feelings and still get those things done? How do we come alongside women and help them be successful? How do we come alongside another man and call that man out? How do we how do we, how do we serve as a bystander or an upstander? And so that's just some of the ways in which we stand by to help women, and and we absolutely continue to do that because we believe in we believe in the values that we espouse at Cisco. Big smile on my face. I think it's across the board as well. We all felt that. Thank you, Tony. We've had some great experiences and perspectives shared by our esteemed leaders. Let's transition to share an individual contributor's experience. Marley, how have you leveraged inclusive communities throughout your journey at Cisco? been quite an interesting journey for me i must say um it's so it's so inspiring being today here with all of you guys it's greatly greatly appreciated but in my journey um it's quite interesting because it has pivoted a little bit i started my career at cisco poland um over a decade ago and because of my interest of learning and growing from people i started connecting with them with offering Spanish lessons at the Krakow office for those who wanted to improve their language skills. 
um, after that, and being that I got very energized by that work, I started getting involved with the Connected Poland team, which is a group of people that intended to connect, build a sense of community for the Cisco Poland team. They've grown ever since, and they're amazing right now. After some time in Cisco Poland, I had the amazing opportunity to move and relocate to Cisco Peru, where I serve as the HR business partner for the CANSAC sales organization. It was an amazing opportunity that I had there. And given my proximity with the region, being Venezuelan, um, and the interest I have in diversity and gender initiatives, I decided to get involved with the America's Woman of Cisco uh, ERO uh, co-hosting or co-leading the Peru chapter, which was an enormous and amazing opportunity to learn what we really mean by diversity and, and what we really mean by inclusion. So yet again, another opportunity of relocation came along and of course I took it. And I am now based in Canada, um, helping and supporting the Canada team. Here, I've been having the great honor and opportunity to mentor and be a member of the Back to Business um, chapter for Canada. And I've started getting involved with the Conexion Team Americas, getting that sense of, hmm, let's bring that also to life in Canada. So by being part of an inclusive community, as you can see, it has allowed me to establish networks, partnerships, and connections to continue living my passion of learning and growing from people um, throughout my journey with, with Cisco. So that's that's my story. That's a great story. Thanks, Marley. Rachel, Rachel Waters, let's have you address that same question. Thanks so much, Marley. Your story is amazing. We definitely need to talk more. Um, you know, Cisco Black professionals and women of Cisco, these communities are so near and dear to my heart. I've been here for 16 years and really have developed um, the second part of my career. I started out as a customer, um, but have been in the industry for over 27 years. And I've never been somewhere where I've been so embraced and also the focus on our development and our wellness and our future growth has been so pivotal and so important. Um, I think these communities bring so much for your own personal development and professional development. And I'll just start with, you know, our very basic needs as human beings, they exist at home and in the workplace, right? You need, you need psychological safety to be able to operate at your best. You really do need a sense of well-being. Even when there's stress, you need to know how to come out of that stress in a positive way. And, um, and, and with that, a sense of connection or belonging. And, and I think that is truly what has kept me here at Cisco. This community offers that curated space of psychological safety. And as Denise stated earlier, in most rooms I enter, I'm an only and a first, right? As so many of us share probably on this call, I am always in this skin as a black woman, as an engineer, and as a sales leader. And I often find myself, I'm also a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, and it takes vulnerability to walk in and share with people at work what's happening in your real, in your home life, as well as in your work life. I happen to have a husband that works at Cisco and children that want to be like mom, but to walk into CBP and to walk into women of Cisco, I know other people are having that same experience. And we can talk about that and understand the nuances of that. And that's restorative energy you get when you see people. So I don't know, for those of us that haven't had a chance to see, you know, your Wolfpack at Cisco Live or Impact, you know, Rachel knows when we get together, we have so much fun. It's just the happy hours, the learning, it is a gift. And it's rare to find. I've worked at many other places, as many of us have. And opportunities to do things that CBP will curate for you, like the IT Senior Management Forum or the Executive Leadership Council events or Next Generation Leaders Training with your employee or um, manager um, or Girls Power Tech. I mean, how? come on, we get to do this. This is like the way we earn our living. It's just, 
it's just, it's an amazing thing to see people that look like you. It's like looking in a mirror and knowing people love you back. And I just want to share that because it's important to be able to breathe and like, just be here and then go do your job. Like Gloria was talking about, like bringing that authenticity, you also have to be able to know that you have support, right? And what Tony's work, the Men for Inclusion work, Annie's work, Chickenomics, how to eat better, how to be more mindful, how to make your money work for you. I mean, all these, all these folks are doing amazing things and it's not their main job. <laughs> It's not even the way they deliver the, the most value to Cisco in, in terms of our you know revenue and all the other things we get to do in sales and in engineering. But these are meaningful things that help us thrive as a collective. And we get better as an organization through that learning. And I just, I'm so appreciative of the place of belonging that it's taken me to because we were powered by purpose, right? So how are we gonna get there without celebration? without places to go and say, high five you on that promotion, high five you on that life event. That's just, that's joy that we need to bring into the workplace all the time. But on the flip side of that, you know, the past three years, we all experienced a lot. Tony's point about what women went through, the loss, the trauma, the exhaustion. We needed to actually come together as a community and heal from that. And when I think about Brene Brown's story in Braving the Wilderness, she talked about describing um, what we need as social beings. And she said that collective events experienced in person are incredibly important to remind us that we are together. We are one and we are more connected than we like to think. And uh, you know whether we're experiencing great joy or sadness, um, this actually, speeds up the process of healing if we're together. And that's where I feel these communities, it, it really touches my heart because it helped me find my place and help me lead through adversity. So that's, that's vital, y'all. If, if we're not here, where else can we spend our time? Yeah. Hashtag Wolfpack. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Um, let's hear from Annie. I am just incredibly inspired by everything people are saying. I'm so excited to be here um, because my my story is a, a similar and yet a little different. I started at Cisco about three years ago, and of course, the first group I joined was women at Cisco because clearly I'm a woman at Cisco. Um, but what happened over the past three years is a lot if you think about the past three years. And so um, when George Floyd was murdered and there was such an outpouring of emotion inside Cisco and such an outpouring of support inside Cisco, um, I really felt like I wanted to connect to the black community um, to be able to, to learn how to be a better ally. I, I wanted to learn. And so when we talk about Rachel and we talk about Chanel and discussing safe spaces, at the same time as being an ally, it's been interesting to engage in EROs because not only am I in Women of Cisco, I'm also in CVP as an ally, a listener, an observer. So the way that I have used these official EROs is finding ways to know where I stand up and speak because like in MFI, my voice has value to the people who are there to learn from me. And then in CBP, where I need to stand back and I need to listen to understand. Um, and then in Women of Cisco, it's both. Um, but with women of Cisco, what was happening, um, was that I kept seeing these fidelity webinars that came through and I said, man, I, is there, is there anybody who just wants to talk about money? So in women of Cisco, I actually ask as part of that community feeling like there was a, there was a need inside me to talk about money with women because the cultural barriers that we face to being able to build wealth and talk about wealth are very different than, um, other communities. Um, I said, is there, are there any chicks that just want to talk about money? And I had a bunch of people who raised their hands. And so out of women of Cisco started a little special interest group called Chickenomics. It's not official. This is a special interest group that we have partnered with women of Cisco, but it's really 
spawned from the group inside Women of Cisco who said, we have this in common. Again, it started from commonality. We have this in common. Let's take it into a group and really dig down and dive down deep. And what's happened is it, it went from 75 people or 200 people the first day. We just reached 2,600 people this week. And so Chickenomics started with women talking about money and now it's extended and now it's um, men and women and uh, across the gender spectrum. Um, it is all, all, it represents all of Cisco um, everywhere, it's global. And we focus on the vulnerable, transparent discussions about generating wealth, the emotional challenges about generating wealth. And that came from a heart that was a woman's heart of wanting to talk about things with women. It was that safe space where I said, I want control of my money. I want to know what to do. I need help. I am vulnerable and transparent and authentic. Women of Cisco help me. And we stepped up something amazing that now is available to all Ciscoans. And since then, that intersectionality of women and finances, it's not just women and finances where there's an intersectionality. It's the black community and finances. We had a question, we've partnered with um, CBP and posted questions of the day about financial questions that are specifically applicable to the black community. With pride, we did it. We posted questions that are specifically applicable to the LGBTQIA plus community. This year, we're working with adult caregivers and CAN, Conexion. We've talked with the vets community. We've talked with other official EROs to be able to understand how our special interests can intersect with what their goals and priorities are. And so for me, it's very complicated because it's not just women of Cisco, and it's not just listening or engaging. It's, it's using women of Cisco to create something completely new and unique that is tethered to the heart of other communities inside Cisco. And I can't imagine it happening in any other company. Honestly, it's been amazing. I can't imagine this problem not having you at the helm. Well done, Annie. Okay, let's wrap with another perspective from Chanel. Thank you so much, Mona. And what I love about Rachel Waters and Annie Hardy is that I have the pleasure of knowing them both very well. When I first started here at Cisco, it was almost four years ago, my team lead on my small business velocity team just so happened to be the RTP CBP lead. He immediately got me connected to other black professionals at Cisco. I felt like I was at home. I posted a question just as Annie referenced in the women of Cisco space, just asking about money. Cause remember I'm a math nerd. I actually get excited the closer we get to April 15th because I've done my own taxes for the last 10 years. I enjoy doing it by hand with pencil. I know I'm in a small minority. And so out of that, she was the brainchild and started Chickenomics. And I have the honor of serving with her as her DEI uh, board lead, and then also one of the co-leads for her event strategy team. And so over the course of the, the following years, we've had so much change. We are living life through uncertainty. It doesn't just affect the tech industry. Um, it doesn't just affect our gender. But one thing that we can be certain of is that we have each other's backs. Just plainly said, we are working from home. Um, things are tough. Things that Tony referenced, you know, sometimes we're the only parent or the other only person in our household with multiple children, that's tough. Even if you have a partner at home, that's tough. So where can we go to feel safe, to feel loved, to feel heard, and to just really show up as our authentic selves and still get our work done? And I believe places like CBP and Chickenomics and Women of Cisco and many other EROs here, there is when I say that I have drunk the Cisco Kool-Aid, I have not just done that. I have taken a very nice Carolina Blue IV syringe and I have injected into my veins. It just so happened that I'm also a UNC alum, go Tar Heels. And serving at the pleasure of the RTP campus brings us so much joy. So within Women of Cisco, being the largest ERO at Cisco, the Women of Cisco Carolinas chapter is one of the largest chapters. And so um, tomorrow, March 9th, we are putting on a fabulous event 
first time in person. And that's where we get to celebrate and give back to all of our executive sponsors at the international level, like Denise and Rachel and Thamaya, and then also recognize our local executive sponsors because they're really our boots on the ground support. And just so to wrap it up with a really quick story about how this has personally impacted my life. I, if you can't tell, I like to live life out loud, an internal optimist. And, but I also like to lean into things that are a little bit awkward. So one of the things that we did in partnership with Women of Cisco and Chickenomics is that, you know what, we took burning questions, those questions that people ask but are afraid to answer. And so we put it on events in the past called Navigating Your Life After Divorce. How do you handle your finances? We were blown away with the amount of public and silent support that we received. And so when you have a place like Women of Cisco, like CVP and many other places to go, where you can be heard, be understood, you eventually want to show up to work and that impacts job productivity, job morale, and ultimately a bottom line. So again, I am so happy to be here, so happy to serve with all of you. And um, this is just an incredible, incredible place to be. Thank you, Chanel. I think that was the most perfect wrap. We've heard some practical, heartfelt, and quite special perspectives on purposeful and intentional career journeys that involve using inclusive communities to contribute to their professional and personal growth. I thank you all for spending time with us and for sharing your special stories. Jen, let's take it over to you to close. Thank you, Mona, and thank you all for spending time with us today at Women of Impact. A special thank you to the panelists for sharing their perspectives on how inclusive communities help them on their journey, and to Mona for doing an incredible job moderating this conversation. We hope that the stories everyone shared today will inspire you to reach out and get involved in any of the amazing inclu inclusive communities on the screen now. As you see, there are many to choose from. We encourage you all to join one that expands your network and increases your awareness of Cisco's employee resource groups. You can also find information in the, on the available inclusive communities across Cisco using the QR code on the screen. Joining an inclusive community is simple and is done in Workday by following the directions on the screen. As Mona said at the beginning, it's been a great day of sharing and celebrating our theme of Powered by Purpose. Thank you all.